Lace them up, let's start the show. We're digging in with Trey. 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 We're digging in with Trey today. Yeah. Oh, that song always gets me going. Nice job, Tim Tracy, digging in, emulating the great Kaniac, Neil Diamond. Um, this is a very uh, special, we hope impactful, uh, digging in episode. Um, we have invited back uh, my dearest of friends, Kevin Weeks, um, to speak about a variety of issues um, on and off the ice, in the bubble, outside the bubble. And we'll get to that uh, momentarily. Um, but a couple of housekeeping issues first. Uh, number one, um, I want to encourage everybody and continue to do so both on our audio podcast platforms and on YouTube uh, to be very honest about what you think of digging in so far. How can we become uh, more desirable to you, uh, more satisfactory to what you're looking for, uh, whether it be listening or watching? Uh, also on YouTube, really encourage you, and I'm really fired up about this to be, tell you the truth, is to ask questions on our YouTube platform uh, that you want answered, whether it be about a particular episode, anything. Uh, I'll look through and I will answer those questions as long as they're appropriate, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Um, this uh, really special episode um, that we'll get to in a minute, featuring Kevin Weeks for the second time, uh, is sponsored by um, the great people at New Country Auto Group. Uh, my dear friend, Jared Cantanucci, a guy that, uh, well, he was never blessed with a growth spurt, uh, but still managed to uh, put together a 152-point season, one of his years in just 50 games at Shattuck St. Mary's. It, uh, it proved that, uh, A, he has finishing ability, which he has taking, taken to the car world. And uh, it's not the size of the frame, it's the size of the heart in finding the red light district, the back of the net, as the great Jared Cantanucci always did. Uh, he went to Harvard and has taken those talents uh, in beyond successful fashion to new country. Well, what can I tell you about the new country auto group? You're talking about dealerships. Um, multiple dealerships in Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Florida. I bought uh, my car uh, down in West Palm Beach at his, uh, his fantastic uh, Mercedes dealership. You're talking Mercedes, you're talking Ferrari, you're talking uh, Porsche, you're talking uh, Maserati, you're talking Lexus. Uh, across the board, a new country auto group is in a league of its own because I really do believe that every customer that walks in the door in any one of those dealerships in any one of those states and locations feels like they're the only person on the planet. Newcountry.com. And to Zim's Vodka. Boy, Zim's Vodka, a very faithful sponsor here of Digging In with Trip. Um, again, a heck of a, a story um, when it comes to leadership of the smoothest vodka on the planet. Uh, Terry Olson, Western Canadian. Um, went to uh, Notre Dame in Wilcox, Saskatchewan, just like the great Rod Brindamore did, Curtis Joseph, Wendell Clark. Uh, he was a hockey player, took those talents to Western Michigan, then had a, a, a very significant career in the business world. But in his heart, he eventually knew that his love was and his passion was for vodka. So he spent a ton of time in, in Poland because it's uh, potato made vodka, was very patient, didn't jump the gun too early, as we often do. Um, to make sure when Zim's Vodka went to market, um, there was no stone left unturned. And his, he has different levels. His Zim's 59, I have to tell you, is the smoothest thing on planet Earth. And if you don't believe me, I've told this story. There's a golf course outside of Columbus, Ohio, uh, Double Eagle, where Zim's is exclusively sold. The Tiki Hut, Wayne Gretzky came through, liked it so much, he signed the bottle, uh, 99. And you can find that on their Zim's Vodka Instagram handle. Zim's with, <laughs> I always, and I always think about, you know, because I got, there's Zins and there's Zim's and, oh, what, you know, Zim's with an I dot com. So without further ado, 
um, an extremely meaningful digging in episode for me, um, the great Kevin Weeks. Well, welcome to a very special edition of Digging In. And for the first time, I invite back a guest for the second time. And that is uh, my dearest of friends, Kevin Weeks. So Kevin, I usually start every show asking how you define digging in. We've already done that. I said last week when you exhibited indescribable leadership in these most important of times that we're all lucky if we have enough unconditional friends to fill the fingers for those watching on YouTube on, on one hand. You certainly have a finger, so I'm going to ask you right now which one you want. <laughs> I will say the thumb. Because it's like a goalie. It's independent, but it's a part of the team, which you can yeah. relate to being a former tender yourself. <laughs> you have the thumb, and I'm glad you didn't pick another one because this show would have ended before it started. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man oh yeah, i love you i would say yeah you love and i run the, um how would you uh speaking of of digging in on the most important things sure. um in our existence how would you describe uh last week i'd say last week was historic uh it was momentous it was uh riveting it was thrilling and i would say that it was a roller coaster ride if i had to characterize it characterize it as one thing it felt like a roller coaster ride there were a lot of ups and downs and a lot of twists a lot of turns a lot of drops but i felt that even through that and at some of the lowest points in that time just around uncertainty and around some of the flammable nature that some of this has taken i also feel like it's been a, a great catalyst for change and for change in the right direction. And I, and I have to tell you, you know, I've been fortunate as of you to be a part of this league for so long. And there's so many great people that we know in this league in different capacities, people that we played with, that we work with, that are personal friends, that are professional colleagues. I never thought though, and, and that's a testament to all those people, but I never thought ever that I would see NHL players band together the way in which they did I mean, we've had everything from, you know, work stoppages to more work, stop, work stoppages to now COVID, but in and around beyond the pandemic, but inside a bubble for players to come together and support us as the current black players now being a former black player and clearly a, a black man and a, and, a, and a black TV analyst and personality. I never thought that we'd see that level of support. And that was really moving. Like some of the stuff that some of the players that were involved involved in this uh, were kind enough to share with me in, in private conversations. Just the fact that, you know, Luke Shen, so many, Kevin Shattenkirk, Coburn, I mean, I can go on and on, Bo Horvat, all the players that offered their support to the black players that are in the bubble, but of course, uh, and beyond that, it's, and people of color, it's, it's just been really moving. And again, uh, we have a lot of great people that are very high in their character in our sport throughout the eras, but the NHL players took it to a whole different level as did the other sports. I, I don't want to, I certainly want to give credit where it's due. The WNBA women's players, the MLS soccer players, the NBA, and I think the cultural demographics in those sports are different than they are in ours, which made ours even more eye opening. And I couldn't be any more grateful than I am to, to what those players stepped up and did in support of us. And not only as you know black people in the business or the black players, but also for us as people in society and as black people in society and people of color, um, for those players to step up the way they did is, is beyond, I don't even know if you can ever repay that really. I wanna, I wanna dig into that. Um, sure. And, and we see, um, I've been told, obviously, player-driven what happened in, in both mm -hmm. bubbles. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that players that maybe hadn't thought about it to the extent that needs to be prior to um, mm -hmm. were given access to, whether it be Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, yeah. Instagram accounts, of what um, black players deal with when they mm -hmm. leave the arena. Because we know that as hockey players, it makes our sport great. I know I grew up here in Detroit 
and exactly. played with played with with kids of all different backgrounds, color, uh, faith, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all I cared about was the team. But exactly, yeah. I, I never thought about when a black player goes home. You know, so if you would, I remember being your color analyst in that incident mm -hmm. in Montreal. Um, years, can you can you paint a picture? And is that true? That that really opened a lot of eyes to the players and, and the way they, re they the, the way they reacted last week in the bubble. Yeah, you're spot on with that. I mean, yeah, it, it opened a lot of eyes. It opened a lot of ears. It opened a lot of minds. And probably as importantly, if not more so, it opened a lot of hearts as well. It really did. I mean, players were floored when they saw some of the messages, when they heard some of the messages on those conference calls. And, and many of them were appalled, really, quite frankly. And, you know, that's just not even the tip of the iceberg in terms of what that experience can be like on the on – the, on the wrong side of, of, of this experience, which shouldn't really happen just based on where you land on the color wheel, you know, but the ugly side of that and the ugly side of people's response to that is what was shared. Uh, some of that was shared in those conference calls. And I know for a fact, um, a lot of those players that saw that and a lot of the white players, they, they were absolutely slack jawed. They couldn't believe that people would have the gall, people would have the lack of human decency, the lack of character, the lack of class, the lack of tolerance, the lack of common sense, really, because, I mean, I didn't really see much of that in third grade or fourth grade, let alone these are adults that, that are posting that kind of stuff and sending those types of direct messages. So that really opened up the eyes and the hearts and the minds of a lot of those other um, white players and created a lot of space, something I'll get into, but it created a lot of space for empathy and compassion and just humanity 101. You know, if you open your door, for example, if we open our front door here and we look out at New York City and we see our neighbors across the street here in our neighborhood, if something's happening to them, heaven forbid, like we're not sitting there, we're not analyzing and we're not going to then say, well, I don't know. Well, maybe not because I don't know, they're Italian, so we're not really sure. Like, heaven forbid, there's something happening. You go over there and you try to help. Like, that's just basic human intuition and human instinct. So the fact that there is a percentage of the population that doesn't have that. Uh, it really shone light on that to a lot of the players, the other players. And that, if anything, really emboldened them even more to be even more supportive. Now, to your other question, Tripper, about that incident in Montreal and the, the playoffs when I was with the Canes in 02. I mean, you know, I'll just start by saying, like, the players on our team, my teammates couldn't have been any more supportive, you know, the great Jim Rutherford, our GM at the time was amazing. Our staff, Tatesy, everybody were awesome. You know, my teammates were, were really supportive and, and caring. And of course, Paul Maurice, who is a great, not only a great coach, but a great humanitarian, as you know, all too well. He was awesome. In fact, him and I actually just spoke about that. He was kind enough to check in on me about a month ago uh, during the course of all this. And, and we actually spoke about that. And that's the type of depth of character that you know the canes have had over the years and they certainly had during my time which i was really appreciative of which quite frankly is a big part of the reason why i was able to thrive there because opportunity wasn't blocked and um you know the human empathy was there the compassion was there for me as a person number one but as a player number two you know so that incident though specifically i mean to be at your place of work and to be in montreal which, you know, the esteemed franchise that they are, the Canadians, more Stanley Cups than any team in NHL history. Really the New York Yankees, if you will, in terms of history, right? And Stanley Cups. For that to happen there, and a, a knucklehead fan to do that and throw a banana in my direction, first of all, it showed that the fan was a knucklehead and had no, no class, number one. But just imagine being at your place of work and living your dream and you're playing the Stanley Cup playoffs with your teammates against the most – storied historic franchise and somebody does that and that wasn't the first time that something like that had happened to me or any other player of color for that matter or what have you but it should have very well been one of the last but it wasn't and it hasn't been and you know those are the types of things for me where as a son as you know as a partner as a brother as an uncle now I mean I can go on and on nobody deserves that and nobody certainly deserves that on the basis of their faith, as you pointed out, or, you know, their religion or what part of the world they come from, what their, 
gender may or may not be their sexual orientation. Nobody deserves that. And that's why I've been, you know, when I played, there's a lot of those things that took place and I would bite my tongue a lot. And, but I, I made a vow to myself when I was done playing that any of those, uh, any of those indecencies from people, I would never allow that to, to happen again. And not without me having something to say about it. And there's different ways of going about it. So, but all that to say, I, I withheld a lot of that as a player in fear of retribution and, and I never would do that now. Uh, in my second career as a broadcaster, I vowed to myself 11 years ago that anytime people were acting that way or that they came to me that way, I was gonna say something about it and defend myself and whether they liked it or not, because here's the thing, for the perpetrator, and this is great for the audience out there, for the perpetrator, they can't be the perpetrator and then conveniently re rewrite the script to be the victim at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that just doesn't work. So, you know, you can't be the person, I'll put it in hockey terms. You can't be the person that cross checks somebody from behind. You deliver the cross check to a player's lower back and say it's women's hockey and you, you cross check the lady in front of you, the opposing player. She goes head first into the boards, heaven forbid. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh man, she's such a phony, oh my back. Like who does that? Like, you know what I mean? Like who does that? And unfortunately, there is a segment of, of the people in the population that are knuckleheads enough to do that, but not only do that, be able to get away with doing that as well. Therein lies part of the problem. Well, I'm going to we'll jump around here because there's so many uh, yeah, sure. beyond important things to cover and I want to ask you about. You use the word knuckleheads. And, mm. you know, it's um, whether it be your time in Raleigh or New Jersey or Florida or Vancouver, um, the Islanders, you know, there are bad apples in, in every lot. And, Holy. okay, so like take, you know, like I, I mentioned those different spots because you and I sure. know countless wonderful um, police officers. That we, okay, so, but, you know, as we learned in the NHL the last couple of years, the vast majority of, of, of players are not bad apples. There's been some, there's been some bad apple hood behind the bench. There's been bad yep. apples. And, so I guess with the combination of your character, intelligence, approach, and education, I know it's a general question, but sure. how would you go, of, go about getting rid of those bad apples? I mean, first of all, whoever that perpetrator would be, you know, let's say, let's look at the different levels. So let's say they are in management. Well, if they're in a managerial capacity or a senior executive leadership capacity, and they were a violator, let's say, then to me, they should be suspended, suspended without pay, and either undergo some mandatory diversity training and or depending on how far along the scope that is, um, of course, they're going to say there needs to be an investigation. But once there is actual proof, there's really not much to investigate. And I think that that could be grounds for dismissal or termination. Um, I, I believe that people, and we've all made mistakes in life, every one of us in different capacities. So there can be a little bit of space and perhaps time with work and, and, and commitment to improving. I, I certainly think within any human, we have the capacity to do that if we so choose. But all that to say, at those senior levels, that has to be, it has to be clearly enforced to where people know that there's absolutely no margin for that whatsoever. It won't be tolerated. And then, of course, the same thing at the coaching ranks. You know, we've seen that, and I've seen it firsthand from a managerial level. I've seen it from a coaching level at times in terms of the way that that'll color people, people's, pardon the pun, but kind of impact or influence people's assessment of a player or of a person for that reason. And, you know, in, in life, people always have, we always have our preconceived biases to a certain extent, whether you, I don't know, you're into, you're into equine, you're into horses, you, you know, show jumping or maybe thoroughbred, you're a part of the horse culture, you're part of hockey culture, maybe you're part of yachting or boating or golf or whatever, you know, there's, we all have, we always have these different subsets, but nonetheless, even within those or outside of those, it, it should be a pretty zero tolerance on those types of violations. So I say that from an, it's an executive and or coach or senior management figure. Same thing from your scouting staff, 
Uh, same thing uh, in terms of all of your employees at various levels, be it season ticket sales, marketing, communications, trainers, uh, whatever level. I think that that needs to be enforced. And especially with fans, because sometimes, not even sometimes, far too often I see for all the amazing fans that we have out there, and there are millions of them around the world, but far too often I see, as you mentioned, some of the bad apples who say, well, I paid this money, so I'm entitled to say what I want. I've never had that privilege to think that way. And I don't even see that as a privilege, but you know, if I go to, or if we go to dinner at a restaurant in New York city here, we don't think because we're paying that we can say whatever we want to the service manager or to the, any other member of the staff or to the, you know, back of the house, front of the house staff. We, it's not even a thought, you know, we're, we're world travelers as are you. And, you know, imagine us being in, uh, Imagine us being in Le Marais in Paris, for example. You know, how are we going to come in there as Canadian Americans? How are we going to come in there in Paris and try to impose upon the Francophone people that are there what we think and what we want and act as though we can talk down to them? I mean, that's just asinine. You know what I mean? It, so the, that simple notion of tying that back to fans or attendees that are at games or sporting events you pay your ticket you pay for your ticket and, and you know everybody at all of us in the business we appreciate that but that doesn't you're not entitled then to to be belligerent and you know yell racial epithets and or slurs or religious slurs or uh, anything of that sort lb lgbtq slurs um, that doesn't entitle you that platform to be able to do that and in the event that that happens you're gone Either you're gone for the year or you're, you're banned from the rink in general. You can't come back. So I think that we need to make it punitive enough to where people understand that not only is it not cool, not, out, not only does it show that you're, you, you don't have any class or any decency or any sense of humanity, but you're just unwelcome and you're not welcome back. So I think that that will go a long way in deterring that type of behavior. Very well, succinctly and eloquently said. Um, I was uh, watching this Saturday afternoon um, yeah. with uh, well, your buddy, part of the Weeksy family, my mom. No. Uh, and it was, it was right after the conclusion of the, the Tampa-Boston game. Yeah. And I was sitting there, uh, Delane, getting on my Peloton, as I always do. Well, yes, and, <laughs> yeah, we can relate. <laughs> so, so but, but I thought you made a tremendous comparison and analogy, speaking of approach. You mm -hmm. talked about a coach in hockey and to get the best out of a player, to get a player to learn, um, knowing that player personally. So that dictates your approach. Exactly. And in this, mo and, and, and Kevin, well, I never call you Kevin. This one. I love that. Stuff. That's good. Yeah, you're really <laughs> digging in. I love it. That means you're, you're, you're dug in, forget digging in, you're dug in. <laughs> so in, in this uh, most, in this yeah. most uh, volatile, sensitive, Sure. Of times and topics, I want you to speak about that because I thought that was brilliant. Like the Scotty Bowmans of the world, that was right. an underrated part of who they are. Sure. The approach and knowing the individual or the group of individuals and how you have to be diligent and thoughtful and thorough in that approach. Yeah, I mean, unquestionably so. It's funny you mentioned that, Tripper, because I was just on the phone with Rupper a little earlier today with Mike Rupp, Stanley Cup champ, Game 7 hero, uh, great friend one of the top class guys that I played with. And, you know, he's with us on the NHL network. He's an outstanding analyst. And he was actually just talking about that. We were breaking that down in terms of being able, as he was saying too, he's echoing the same thing. You have to get a feel for the person to better understand them and then be more adept at being able to connect with them and coach them as a player, because every person has their own makeup. And, you know, if you look at say, down there in Raleigh, Jordan Stahl's makeup might be different coming from Thunder Bay, Ontario, than Martin Nook's makeup. His might be different than Peter Morazic's, who you did such an amazing job with here on the podcast. But listening to Peter's story and how he came to be a goalie and his path is different from that of James Reimer, who, you know, every individual is their own person and they have their own background, their own journey through family, their own journey through the sport, their own experiences along the way. And those things are really important. And I, I've, I've often found that the, the most, 
the coaches that I've loved playing for the most, and Paul Maurice being one of them, John Torchetti along the way being one of them. I mean, there's several that I can mention, but those coaches really did an outstanding job. My goalie coach, Sudzi Maharaj, who's the uh, Anaheim Ducks goalie coach for years now, they did a really good job of doing that. Like they, they took the time and created that, that kind of space to learn what made me tick and to learn the way I was wired and to get a better sense of me as a person. And by connecting with me on that level here and then here, then they were able to connect with me on any of the technical elements of playing, you know, and, and that went a long way. And same thing, you know, you've been in the business, you played the position, you played at a high level too, and you've been in TV for such a long time. I find that the really good TV people, the top notch producers and or directors or whatever the case may be, they're very similar that way too. You know, they don't try to overimpose or superimpose. They'll find a way to connect with you. And, uh, you know, it, it's a contemporary time now, Tripper. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you need to be very contemporary. People do in their approach. And by that, I mean coaching, management, uh, whatever, leadership, senior leadership, television, film, whatever your, your, your line of work, service, industry, you have to be very contemporary now. And especially today's players, as you saw the players that we just finished seeing, as we talked about, with what they were willing to stand for and what they were willing to not stand for anymore. Uh, the way in which they receive feed feedback, the way in which they, the lenses through which they see the world, the multi-platforms as we're here now via Zoom, uh, it, it's, it's changed the world in a lot of ways and it's opened up people's minds and eyes and how we learn and our aptitude and stuff. So you, you, gone are the days before where, you know, I had a, I had a coach, <laughs> I had a coach after one of my starts and I won't say which one cause it'll say who it was, but after one of my starts, I was live on TV post game. I was early in the NHL at that point. Felt good about the game. We tied the game. I think I was one of the three game stars and it was early in my career. And the coach came up behind me and slapped my headset off live on TV during an interview. Like, and not horsing around, not like kind of smiley. Although it was in bad form, if, even if he did that, it was in such awful form. And I had to do everything in my instinct to not like turn around and say anything. And I was live on TV as a young, you know, young goalie just trying to cut my teeth in the league. And for him to know that he could do that and feel emboldened enough to be able to do that is a head scratcher and therein lies the problem for me so those days are gone or you know this tripper too like you'd see the coach coming or the gm coming like i would literally duck the other way yeah. duck straight in the weight room i'm on the bench press straight into whatever like i would see them coming i'm out of here and those days are gone you know you need to now be able to have a personal connection and i feel the people that do that and create that uh that vibe and that relationship they're going to have uh, players and employees and staff and associates that are more invested in doing well, for sure. Well, you, you, you just mentioned uh, in, in that super answer, the word time, okay, mm. on several mm. occasions. Okay, so we're most familiar with this time right now, the present. Totally. But, but I want to go back in time. Yeah, a couple please. Of different, a couple of different uh, uh, key times in, in, in the United States in history, Canada's sure. history, sports history. Yeah. So I want to start and ask about some some athletes and in, in uh, with different platforms and different sports. Okay. That that utilized so positively mm -hmm. um, their position and who they were to impact social change. So I want to start and get your thoughts on each of these these great athletes. Sure. I want to start it. with I want to start with Jesse Owens. Jesse yeah. Owens. Yeah. I mean, not only the best in the world, but also was cognizant of the fact, which will be common amongst all of them, but cognizant of the fact that he was running for something that was much bigger than himself and his immediate team, but also the country, the world, and, you know, black people and people of color. And, you know, one of the things about sports is, in a lot of ways, people look at it as, as athletes being self-absorbed. But, you know, Tripper, you having been one yourself, you know quite often that you're competing for way more than you. And there are other people that you're cognizant of that have helped you, you know, be it your mom, be it your late dad, be it a sibling, be it an aunt, uncle, be it a grandparent, be it, uh, you know, a great coach that you had along the way, your teammates, 
you know, you always talk about pure Michigan, you know, you're such an advocate, you're such an advocate for that. And, uh, you know, you've done such an amazing job. You've done such an amazing job of doing that. You know, the pride that you have, um, your family, the Fords, like all the different legacies that you have, but you're very prideful about that. Right. And you realize that it's more than, Hey, this is trip Tracy on the mic. Like you've already seen your name in lights for years. You've already seen your name and you know, um, the free press and everything else growing up as a kid playing in tournaments. Like that's not anything new for you. So uh, Jesse Owens came at, at such a pivotal time and such an impactful time. And for him to have the courage and, and also the, the wherewithal to be the advocate that he was under those circumstances at that time. Incredible. Incredible. Um, you know, you, you just brought me back because, you know, I obviously didn't have your NHL career. We both played the same position. And we actually first met in this building, in the Greensboro Coliseum, <laughs> yep. when you were playing, at, you know, for the, the Monarchs with yep. uh, Carolina Monarchs. And I was yep. playing for Springfield in the American League. Who would have known that we'd become Crazy, brothers right? like this all these years? But Ex my exactly. one thing backing up in the NHL, because you mentioned that, I can still remember vividly during warm-up, and we're playing – an elite team at the time in the Dallas Stars and I'm taking shots and I can see over in the corner because my mom and dad flew in last oh. minute from Michigan and I was oh, crying God. I was crying behind my mask because oh. I that exact yeah. thing everybody that's part of that moment and so you just you're you're absolutely right in what you stand for and therefore the opportunities to uh it with that attention speak on behalf of all of the people um, that have been part of your journey. Um, speaking of guy, a guy that has been and is part of your journey. What about Willie O'Ree? I mean, wow. Willie is cool. It's so cool because I had the chance to meet him as an, as a young player during my young days in the league. I was probably 22, 23 when I first met him. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the, the viewers and the fans tuning in would know this, but, when I was about 23, I started doing different appearances on behalf of the league. And essentially, Willie was named an NHL ambassador at that point. But I, I knew very well who he was. I knew very well what he had accomplished in breaking the color barrier and be, being the Jackie Robinson of our sport. And something that a lot of people don't know, in which Willie told me, he uh, played in a baseball tournament and he actually got to meet the great Jackie Robinson as a kid. So it's ironic that, you know, Jackie Robinson was such a hero to him because Willie played both baseball and hockey. And then Willie ended up breaking the color barrier himself in the NHL and then saw Jackie Robinson. He said Jackie Robinson remembered him as a kid. So if that's not full circle and, and, and you know, so powerful, I'm telling you. But in my times with Willie, and we spent a lot of time together before, and I was just kind of saying, I've been fortunate enough to to be an ambassador for the league since I was actually playing in the league as a young guy up until right now. So that's brought us to different places on behalf of the league, be it Capitol Hill uh, in Washington, speaking to uh, congressmen, congresswomen, uh, going to different youth rinks uh, around the country for clinics and, and speaking to kids, the Fort DuPont program in Washington, D.C. and many others. And uh, it's just awesome because for all that he accomplished on the ice, even though he didn't play in the NHL as long, he was the first one to do it. He was the tip of the spear. And then he played pro 22 years because he played in the old IHL. And he had a wonderful career. Everybody that I talked to raves about the type of player he was, the type of person he was. Obviously, I know the type of person he is. But through trying times, like through the most trying of times. And, but he talked about how great his team or teammates were, especially in Boston with the Bruins and how helpful they were and how supportive they were of him and how uh, even then they were so inclusive and welcoming to him, which is an interesting little part of the story for him. But the, uh, a lot of people wouldn't recognize too the fact that he lost sight in, I believe it's his right eye. But I always say, even though he was visually impaired, he's still a visionary. And he went on to play and he played a long time, as I said, 22 years pro. And a lot of people don't know that he was visually impaired. I think he said he only told one of his siblings uh, during his playing career. Nobody knew. So he was able to adjust to that playing with one eye, actually, literally. 
and what an incredible testament to his character and his belief and and also his conviction and fortitude and love of the game because this is something that a lot of people don't know and we get into this a little bit as we go here sometimes it's hard to love the game when the game for the wrong reasons doesn't necessarily always love you back and you know it's not like you might have had a bad year or you had a bad stretch or maybe it didn't work out with a certain team it wasn't a fit i mean you know, you don't conveniently all of a sudden just change where you land on the color spectrum. It doesn't happen, you know? So for, for those of us who have, who have been faced with that in our sport or in any sport, or, and more importantly in life, that's a needless challenge that nobody should have to have. And that's a big part of creating more of a level playing field so that you don't have to worry about that. Like you're not marginalized or, um, you're not marginalized based on the fact that you're a black hockey player from Chicago, Illinois, or in my case, from Scarborough in Toronto. It should never happen. So, but Willie has done so much and he's loved the game back and he loves the game. He's done amazing work, a champion of our sport for so many girls and boys in all of his uh, community efforts through the league and beyond. He's, he deserves everything that he's gotten and our, he's a hockey hall of famer and congrats to him on that. And our game's a better place because of him, for sure. Thank you for, amen. Mm. Thank you for sharing the, the uh, story. You never told me about his, um, his, his uh, time with Jackie Robinson and then Jackie Robinson's recall. So yeah. for you, specifically Kevin Weeks, why is and will Jackie Robinson always be a hero to you? Well, baseball, you know, they always say it's America's pastime and, and you think of the history of baseball and the institution that it is. And I mean, you know, all the storied franchises from his with the Dodgers to the Yankees to the Red Sox to the Cubs. I mean, you're talking multi-generational history. And ironically, with the NHL network here in Jersey, um, being inside of MLB network, inside of Major League Baseball network, you know, it's pretty ironic. And I grew up loving all sports. I dabbled a little bit in different sports, played some other sports. Hockey was going to be what I was going to make the NHL since I was six. That was my goal. But all that to say, I love baseball. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of the players that have played over the years. I have friends that play or have played. So when you consider what he was able to do under those circumstances, amidst death threats, amidst, uh, you know, people uh, attempting to, to injure him, to kill him, to poison him. I mean, people didn't really stop at anything. And to go out and play, and he was a great all-around athlete as well, but to go out and play with the elite skill set that he had, but also to be able to handle himself with a composure and class and decency in what was, and still is America's pastime, as it's called. I mean, the courage that it takes to do that and then the skill to be able to go out and do that under those circumstances, it's beyond off the charts. And, you know, a lot of people, it's only recently that, that people started acknowledging the Negro leagues in baseball, just like the colored hockey leagues in the NH in hockey, excuse me, the colored hockey leagues of the 1800s that people don't even really talk about. But for Jackie Robinson to perform the way he did on and off the diamond for the ball field, under those circumstances, I mean, that, that's what makes him one of the goats, one of the greats of all time for me. Bill Russell was one of the goats. Um, yeah, specifically, totally. Specifically at the collegiate level, yep. uh, his courage, mm -hmm. how did he utilize his platform uh, to make the world a better place? Well, he, he, he stood by his convictions, and not only did he deliver on the floor, you see all the championships that he had for the Celtics. Again, such an esteemed franchise, one of the, the winningest franchises in all of the history of pro sports, and he was at the heart of that. And, but he also was, was very much an advocate for equal rights, and he was very vocal about that. And what's interesting about that, Tripper, and I've seen this myself, is sometimes when you are just trying to create a sense of equality and fairness and decency and humanity um, and or defend yourself, 
sometimes some people misconstrue that and then they're going to say that you're problematic. So they, there's a lot of these different buzzwords. They'll say that it's problematic or um, they're aggressive or they're uppity or they think they're too smart. I mean, those are code words for the fact that you don't like the fact that they know that you're wrong and they're telling you that you're wrong more often than not. And if you think of that, that era too, for him in basketball, I mean, hoops is very different now than it was then. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these players, a lot of the sports, a lot of the franchises owe a lot of gratitude to people like Bill Russell and what he was able to do with that Celtics team. Red Arbach too, who had the open-mindedness. Red, Ar Red Arbach at that time had the open-mindedness and not all of Boston which is an incredible, incredible city. And you know that so well, based on, you know, you going to Harvard and playing college hockey there. It's an, it's an amazing city. It's a historic city. I love Beantown. I love going there. But it hasn't always had the smoothest race relations, even though it's such an international city, which is hard to consider. So all that to say, for him at that time, let alone at any time too, to be such a visible figure, such a great player, champion how many times numerous times of the boston celtics and yet still not only during his playing career but post playing career stand up for what he believes in you just heard him the other day again who when he was applauding the athletes and the players for for standing up and and saying hey listen all we want is to be treated fairly and he had the guts under again the most trying of circumstances and ironically what is a very international multicultural city like Boston but always hasn't been the most harmonious in terms of those different um, cultural backgrounds and for him to stand up a, I mean for years so he was an advocate before it was even cool and long before it was considered to be uh, the right thing to do or contemporary and as a man of his height and as a black man of his height and his stature uh, for him to to be that from then until now he's been fighting that fight a very long time Staying with uh, basketball with your Nike gear on for those uh, tuning in on YouTube. Um, <laughs> you and I, uh, along with countless other people globally, were yeah. absolutely glued to the last dance. Oh. And so Michael Jordan, he made, being MJ, he made a difference in a different type of way. I think almost anonymously, selflessly, I know I was struck in the last dance, you know, it, just how, I mean, how smart his mom is and clearly, yeah. you know, God rest his dad's soul, but the great upbringing he had, like with, re, with regards to character education, mm -hmm. which is a big part of this in Wilmington, North Carolina, Michael mm -hmm. Jordan, the great Michael Jordan. Um, how did he use his platform and continues to most advantageously? Well, I would say, I mean, we're going to need a whole episode on that and, and what he's done, who he is, what he means to me and, you know, to billions of people around the world and what he's accomplished. But I'll tell you a story, Tripper. When I first got to Greensboro in the American League, it's almost as though this was serendipitous because I was the biggest and remain the biggest Michael Jordan head ever. And... I was always watching him. Hockey was my jam, but I played, you know, basketball in junior high and then a little bit in high school the first few years and left until I went to go play in the OHL and play junior. And I watched everything he did. I mean, the way he played was unseen before at that level, that level of greatness, consistency, intensity, integrity, competitiveness, dominance, persistence, and all those things. Then, of course, the way he carried himself, the shoe phenomenon, which was so transcendent, and the way he presented himself, the way he spoke, the way he worked, the way he cared, his parents, the whole thing. And it really was, for me, kind of a how-to book on becoming an athlete and especially being a black athlete and even more so in a white sport and how important that those things were. So... All that to say, growing up, I couldn't get enough watching him. I couldn't get enough of the magazine, Sports Illustrated, Hoop Magazine, all the rest of them. Anything he was in, I was hyper-consuming. Like, we had VHS tapes, and we'd, you know, rotate them around our buddies. 
Michael Jordan's airtime, come fly with me, all the rest of it. And when I was 20 and I, my first year pro in Greensboro, we go to a restaurant and I meet a gentleman by the name of Fred Whitfield, who's from Greensboro, who was a partner at the time in Whit, Whitfield, Blackman and Morse, downtown Greensboro, a law firm. He was a partner there. And it turns out him and Jordan were best friends for years and they still are to this day. And he is currently the COO and president of the Hornets. Fred Whitfield is, which Jordan owns, which is incredible. But I talked to Fred and I got kind of got plugged in and, you know, I've been to some of Fred's events and then through Fred been to some of Michael Jordan's events and been around him and I've never seen anything like it. So that brings me to the last dance and the last dance is if Mozart were still alive, if Einstein were still alive, if Pablo Picasso were still alive and they were here to be alive and talk about their greatness in a documentary that was 10 parts, that's what we were blessed enough to see. And, you know, what's so incredible about it, again, is it literally was a how-to of persistence, as you talked about, family, education, hunger, drive, commitment to greatness, an insatiable competitive work ethic, will to dominate, commitment to dominate, respect of the craft, and put that all on repeat. No ceilings, no complacency, and put that on repeat. And, and you know, if you saw Tim Grover in there, I had a chance to, to, you know, to get to speak to him a few times, who was Jordan's trainer and the trainer for the late great Kobe Bryant, bless his soul, bless their souls that passed on that copper, on that copter, excuse me. But um, Tim Grover was in the, was in the documentary and you heard him talking about it. And it's, we've never seen anything like that. And for me too, the fact that he was as great as he was on the floor brings me to what he's done off the floor. And he was doing so much for, education he's always been a big champion of education and he's done so much in your state there uh your work state which is a big part of your life in north carolina he's done so much there for education he's done so much for boys and girls clubs he's done so much for uh access to technology computers etc and a lot of what he was doing he was doing at boys at boys and girls clubs make a wish foundation i mean i can go on and on in the different causes and as his career went along and as he became more and more comfortable, he started doing more stuff. And I mean, I can't tell you about the, the youth camps, the boys and girls camps, the basketball camps, sponsoring NASCAR there in, in Carolina, sponsoring motorcycle racing. I mean, and then the hundreds of millions of dollars he's donated to different causes. I mean, even, even now in the midst of this pandemic and amidst all the racial inequality, he just committed $100 million with, between him and his brand, the Jordan brand, which is a subsidiary of Nike, to, uh, to said causes and causes that affect the black community directly and also indirectly and trying to, uh, trying to offset the injustice and the inequality, $100 million. So yeah, he's, he's somebody that's always the North Star for me when it comes to that. And the, keep in mind too, Tripper, like a billionaire as well. And you know, a billionaire and the first black owner of a major league sports team and owning the Charlotte Hornets. And think of all the employees he has. The Jordan brand I mentioned does four or $5 billion a year in revenue as well. So think of the people that he employs and the communities uh, in North Carolina, not only in Charlotte, but and around the world that they impact. It's he's special, man, special, special person. And the goat, the greatest of all time for me in a lot of ways. I, I concur. I you completely know. concur. Boy, mm. I tell you, I, read, I will really have arrived if I'm out uh, uh, going after Blue Marlin with MJ on his boat, <laughs> being, a, being a fellow angler. Um, right. The, you know, for, for any hardworking uh, American, Canadian, anybody around the world, and it's, you sure. know, it's a, it's a hardworking man, it's a hardworking woman, it's a hardworking uh, white man, it's a hardworking black man, same sure. with regards to women. For those that come home and they say, you know what, I've just punched out, I've got to punch in tomorrow morning. When I, when I turn on my favorite sport, I want to be able to watch just sports. Yeah. Um, what argument would you like to make that there are times, and I know it's all circumstantial, that 
there are bigger than sports moments where um, we love their love for a given sport and we hope it's hockey, but, yep. you know, to, to satisfy them that there are times that there are bigger than sports moments that require an athlete or a sport to utilize that platform. Uh, that's an amazing question. You know, I, I'm going to give this, I'm, I'm going to characterize it this way. Athletes and those of us that work in sports, we don't live in athletes or sports bill. So there is an interconnection with us and the great fans that are around the world. And, you know, whether we're going for a power walk in the neighborhood, whether we are, I don't know, running at the track, whether we are in the city in New York and you're at dinner or you're out for a walk or you're on Broadway, we're interconnected with the fans and with the corporate partners. You know, we don't live a, we don't live a separate life from them. We're interconnected. And in those interactions, you know, remember some of them are soldiers as, and in the military and the armed forces, just like when I played in, in Carolina and would host families from Fort Bragg, or some of them are, you know, teachers and you see them, or you see them in restaurants or their neighbors. Hey man, what do you think of the Rangers? Hey man, what do you think of the Islanders? Hey, what do you think of the Canes? Hey, what do you think of the Devils? Hey, did you see that play by the Flyers last night? And we're interconnected. We don't stand alone and they certainly don't stand alone. And you want to be interconnected. And as do we, the last thing that we want to have to talk about are things that are happening for the wrong reasons. You want to be able to just talk about how well the Canes were playing and the strides that Sebastian Ajo made in his game again, the strides that Svechnikov as a budding superstar made again, the great job our guy Rod Brindamore is doing behind the bench is already one of the best coaches in the NHL already. We want to talk about that. That would be ideal. And that alone. The simple fact of the matter is when it's thunder and it's rain and it's lightning and it's hail or it's Hurricane Laura, you can't pretend that that's not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't. I mean, you simply can't. So whether you're prepping for a hurricane and pardon the pun, down there in Carolinas, in the Carolinas specifically, or an impending tropical storm, of course, ideally, we'd like to talk about it being sunny. Of course, you probably want to go to the Outer Banks. Of course, you want to go angling or you want to go down to your lake house or your boat house or whatever it is or get down to the jetty. That would be ideal. But if they say, hey, man, and they prove it on the Doppler that there are 150 mile per hour winds in a category four is impending, that's pretty much proven. And what we've seen through, fortunately, through the smartphones is we've seen examples of and I use that as an analogy, but we've seen examples of that now. So the same way us in sports and the athletes and, and those of us around sports are able to contribute to those causes, to the food drive, to the local YMCA, to a pediatric children's center that needs some new MRIs, to a, a lady shelter, to raising money for the Jimmy V foundation down there. Those are causes. Those are human issue causes and life causes. So too is this. So it's no different. And these causes are no different. And I'm going to tell you something that I haven't spoken about publicly. There's very few people that know this, but based on the depth of our relationship, I'll share this here with you because I'm comfortable enough to do it. For any of your listeners that have any doubt about this, I remember being, 15 years old as a budding top prospect goalie, about 135 pounds, same height. And I'm playing minor midget hockey back home in Toronto at the time. So I have this track, as I said, since I was six, but at that point I was 15, I'm going to play in the NHL. I'm going to play in the NHL. I'm going to play in the NHL. I'm going to make the NHL. And I have a good buddy of mine, and out of respect for him, uh, I won't say his name. He's passed on, and God bless his soul. But I'll explain how this happened. He's 16. He's a year older than me. He's born in 74. I'm born in 75. So he lived in government housing 
in our old neighborhood, we had moved to a new neighborhood. He was an awesome athlete, run, sprints, track, distance, 100, 200, 400, didn't matter. Soccer, basketball, street hockey, uh, came from a single parent household. His mom's a great lady and he had three siblings, a sister and two younger brothers, older sister. And this was a Saturday. It was a Saturday night. He was supposed to take, or Saturday afternoon slash evening. And he was supposed to take the bus up to our neighborhood in the suburbs and, you know, out of the, our old neighborhood and certainly out of the government housing and, and some of the challenges around that environment. So he's supposed to take the transit up. It's half hour on, on one bus. And as time went on, I didn't see him. I didn't hear from him. He didn't call. So we we're supposed to go to a public school about 10 minutes from my parents' house to go and play some outdoor basketball. Now, prior to that, the Saturday prior to that, we we're at my high school because we went to the neighboring high school and my basketball teacher, basketball coach, excuse me, I should say for the high school. And he was the head of his ed at my school. My buddy was there and we were playing pickup, open gym. And after a while, he called us in his office and he says, you guys aren't going anywhere. You two, you're going nowhere. Both of you guys, Kevin, you think you're going to play in the NHL? You think you're going somewhere? You'll never play. Wasting time. You should just be on my basketball team, play on my basketball team and, and, and let it be that. You'll never make the NHL. And you, blank to my friend's name, you're a waste of time. You're going nowhere. Both of you guys, waste. Now, this is me being an elite prospect, not to, at a top, top, top prospect. My name's been in the paper since I was eight, nine years old. I'm 15 at this point, one year away from going to play junior, major junior in the OHL. And this is what this guy's telling me. Again, as our head of phys ed, my basketball coach, head of boys phys ed at high school. So let me bring you back to the Saturday, the following Saturday. That's what he told us the, pre the previous Saturday. So I'm waiting for my buddy. I don't hear from him. He doesn't call my parents' landline. I don't hear from him. I'm like, this is weird. So sun's starting to go down. I've got my basketball. I got my Jordans on. And I'm like, let me call his house. So I call. His mom answers. And I say, hi, ma'am, Mrs. So-and-so. It's Kev. Is he there? Because I'm waiting. I haven't seen him. And she says to me, oh, Kev, he's not coming. He told me to tell you he's not coming. I go, really? Because he said he was coming. Like, and I was going to meet him over at that school. You know, I was going to walk over, ride my bike over and meet him there. And he's going to take the bus. She goes, yeah, I know he usually does that. But he told me to tell you he's going to a house party tonight here in the neighborhood. So he's not going to be coming. I'm like, oh, all right. So anyways, I go to the school. Some scragglers are there. We, you know, we play a little pickup outdoor basketball at the school courts, outdoor courts. Go back home. The next morning, I'm in the car with my dad. We pull up at Chestwood Arena, back home. It's 8.32. I'll never forget it. I could see it on the car stereo. We had the radio on, 680 CFTR radio. And we pull up at 8.32 in the morning, right in front of the rink. I'm about to get my bag, you know, my pads my goalie sticks out of the trunk breaking news breaking news breaking news there was a murder in scarborough 16 year old so and so is his name was shot and killed in mistaken identity and time just stood still i'm walking in about to walk into hockey practice at 8 32 in the morning i'm 15 years old one of my best friends is 16 years old and they announced this on the radio. He was supposed to be with me the night before and God bless his soul, but he chose to go to this house party as many 16 year olds would or might or whatever the case may be. And being as locked in as I am and as I was, I, that just didn't appeal to me. Everything was about playing and, and making the NHL. And it was a house party in the basement. They said that there were a hundred people at the house party in or there and abouts. As there's at, this is what they're announcing on the radio. There were believed to be a hundred 
attendees at the party, 16 year old was shot and killed, shot in the head and killed at close range. And he's been identified as so-and-so. The D, as the, I'm, I'm verbatim, as the DJs took nearly an hour to set up the equipment, Toronto police have been told that they were out of the basement within 15 minutes at said party and so too were all the partiers. When Toronto police arrived on the scene, he was almost dead on the scene, rushed to the hospital. Now, from there, I imagine that duality. Now I'm going into the rink, I'm hollow. And I go into the rink to practice and you know my dad can't believe it and practice is over and I can't believe it. And now my stomach, even now as I tell you the story, and God bless his soul. And if I tell you from there, we go to the funeral with a lot of people from my high school and hit the neighboring high school, which he went to. We went to the same junior high school. We went to public school together. He always wanted to wear my hockey stuff for my hockey teams. Hey, man, can I get an extra hat? Can I wear a T-shirt? Can I wear a leather ja your leather jacket or, you know, your tracksuit top or whatever it is? And we go to this funeral, and by this point, they don't identify the killers. By this point, it's now a big story across all the news in the city. And by this point, he's there, and he's, you know, he's, he's in the casket, and his mom is wailing, and his siblings are wailing, and he's 16 years old. And it's funny, because I Googled this the other day, and to this day, they haven't found the killers. Now, my life could have taken a very different turn. And so too could his life have taken a very different turn if we were together that night as we planned, where we planned. And no blame to his or anybody else, but just imagine that basketball coach that we had and I had because I was at that high school. And imagine what he said to us the Saturday before. Imagine the carelessness of saying that to two youngsters that were never into drugs, weren't in alcohol, all into sports and, you know, relatively decent, pretty good students. And just think of how, just think of that impact that that had, not as much on me, but on my late friend. And who knows what could have happened if, hey guys, sky's the limit for you guys. Hey guys, you guys could become, you know, if you keep working, Kev, you could make the NHL. So-and-so blank, if you keep working, who knows, you might. And our lives forever took a different turn. And fortunately for me and my family, I was able to stay on this path. And unfortunately for him, his life was cut, cut short way too soon. But the reason why I say that, and the reason why I tell that from a first person factual perspective is that for anybody that's a knucklehead enough to say that and not have the space or openness to understand um, just how real this is, that's why, because of the, the great friends that we are and the love we have for each other, I feel safe enough to tell you that. And it's, it's really moving. It's crazy. Wow. We see um, two, because I'm sure he's smiling mm. down upon the path and the journey that you've you've been on and and that path that's only going to get um, better and better and more impactful thank you but before we get on because i want to ask you some questions about your path but after sharing that with me mm. i want to ask you people in positions of authority mm. whether it be that basketball coach phys ed teacher or all of the other coaches in hockey law enforcement i mean yeah, I know it's a it, it's tough to just you know give a, a simplistic answer because every situation, every craft, um, each one of those facets are different. Totally. But if you had one message to people in all walks of life that are in position positions of authority, of how they can get better, how they can avoid mistakes, and if they make a mistake, not chase a mistake. Mm -hmm. What would your message to them be? Lead with service. Lead with service. Have us be of service. Have a service mindset. You know, that's why you, you often hear me talk about military and, you know, I have friends and family that have and do serve. Uh, our good buddy who I put you in, in touch with, J.B. Spiso, 
um, U.S. Army Ranger, you know, my agent, Paul Theofanis, U.S. Delta Force, Green Beret guy, uh, a good buddy of mine, Joel Bowser, who uh, is an amputee, selected amputee by way of being uh, on the wrong side of an IED in, uh, in Iraq, and who want, he's a Michigander, I might add, and wanted to have his leg amputated so that he could use a prosthesis to be able to play hockey still. And he's with the USA Warriors hockey hockey program and he works at the Pentagon there's too many you know my cousins that have and do served and other friends but the reason why I, I say the service piece is they know that they're on a mission that's bigger than themselves his self herself their self and that's for me what I really love there are many things that I respect about them in the services but the fact that in some of them pay the ultimate sacrifice for that service and so too their family members and service so that's what I love about the service industry but I feel like a lot of people feel like they're above service and when I say being above service like oh I can't do that I, I don't have to do that uh, why would I do that like and then it becomes very me centric and very I centric and you know we all have to push and and work and grind and chase our dreams and try to accomplish. It doesn't have to be at the absence of that. But I think at the forefront, if you realize that you're of service to something bigger, more often than not, you can't go wrong because you're, you're trying to be a solution and you're trying to find ways to, to add value and to complement and to create and to work collectively and collaboratively as opposed to imposing upon and you know tripper we we talk a lot about our travels and, and dining and different things that that we really enjoy but at the heart of all that is passion and service you know you think of the great experiences that that we've been able to have and that we've earned to be able to have and some of those i'll tell you a quick story we were in lugano switzerland at the view for any of you that are going to travel once the borders reopen it's an, a magical place in lugano switzerland which is a magical place in and of itself. It's just past Milan and it's the Italian Ticino, as they say, which is Italian region of Switzerland. Elvis Merzlikens for the Columbus Blue Jackets lives there and he played there for Lugano. But all of that to say, we were at the view and when we were leaving, I mean, the service for Get Five Star was 28 star because the service was so amazing and impeccable. But when we were leaving, there's a gentleman and we had rented a vehicle and we're driving back to Milan. So when we were leaving the underground, the underground car pad, the gentleman packed our bags and thank you so much for staying with us. We loved having you here, blah, blah, blah. Literally, he stood there like this as we were driving up the car, the, the garage out into the street, into the mountains and back to Milan. He stood there and he saluted us. I'll never forget that, ever, ever. It was so moving. And, and the reason why I share that is his level of, pride for his role and pride in where he works at that amazing spot and willingness to want to make it special for other people that is really what stuck with me and often it you know a lot of these different places and in life it could be a mom and pop convenience store just think about the service or your favorite italian spot and i don't know maybe in auburn hills you know or a spot that you and mom like going where you get great fish and chips like at the heart of that is service and that's a big part of how i think to answer you succinctly people in a lot of different roles in any role for that matter but hospitality and service and i think if you lead with that in any role of authority or, or executive leadership or coaching or whatever it is managerial capacity whatever coaching i think if you lead with that uh, more often than not you're going to find yourself making the right decisions for the right reasons that's a spectacular answer um, because Thank you. As, soon as, you say, as soon as you said it, do you know what I'm thinking of? Mm. I'm thinking of you and your friend, God rest his soul, mm. sitting Thank in you. with that, that meeting the previous weekend with the, the coach, the basketball yeah. coach, the physical teacher. So yeah. if that coach, that teacher, if he is thinking, he or she is thinking to themselves, service. Mm -hmm. There's no way, I mean, not even a 0.05% chance that they would ever say, 
you're not going to amount to anything and you're not going to amount to anything because there's no way that service. Exactly. So if you're thinking, this is why it was such a spectacular answer. If you're constantly, and I'm going to take this with me, partner. Mm. If I'm constantly thinking about service, he could have said, he, she could have said something to you that, you know what, Kevin, you're a blue chip prospect right now. It looks like headed to the NHL, but I think you can improve this. Totally. That's service. You know, your friend. So I just love to eliminate these negative messages. And sure. if you're thinking about, if he was thinking about, again, he, she, what I, but mm -hmm. the individual was thinking about that, there is no chance, not even 0.001% chance that that individual would have gone about it in the manner that, uh, that it unfolded. Totally. That's why it's a spectacular Let answer. Let me jump on that for a sec. So I'll, I'll put this in hockey terms, right? So we're playing, I'm playing down the road for the Devils the last years of my career. And Prudential Center, where we are here, it's, we're about 10 minutes, depending on, like, if we're leaving now, maybe 10 minutes from Madison Square Garden into the city, 10 minutes from Prudential Center here in Jersey. And Prudential Center had just opened. Okay. And the great Lou Lamorello was our GM. You know, he's the architect of the Devils. Five Stanley Cup appearances, one, three, Hall of Fame general manager, just like Jimmy was and is uh, based on what he's done in, in Raleigh there and obviously in Pittsburgh now. I want you to consider this, right? So Lou's so highly decorated for everything he's done in college hockey. You know, he formed Hockey East and everything else, USA Hockey, Devils, everything. So the a rare occasion, if he was on a scouting mission or something and he wasn't on the road with us, the rare occasion, we would come back to the brand new shiny Prudential Center at the time. We land at Newark in the private terminal, be on the team bus back to the rink and, and Newark to the Prudential Center to get our vehicles. And for the equipment managers to get the gear and bring it into the locker rooms. 1.30 in the morning, Lou Lamorello's lights on. 2.45 in the morning, Lou Lamorello's lights on. Black Mercedes S500 or S550, Lou Lamarill's car's there. At that time, after all he's accomplished in the sport, still working, still grinding, of service. We just moved into the new rink with the practice rink being built into it a la Columbus, as you know, nationwide, that model. Lou did so much work on that building. Details. Literally, the Devils logo on top of the urinals in our locker room. That attention to detail, right? So it's not coincidental that he helped that franchise go to five cups. It's also not coincidental that, um, or not a surprise, that he's now turned around the New York Islanders and they're one way away from getting to the Eastern Conference Final. Him and Barry Trotz for the way they operate as people but also being of service to the sport. Now here's the last part of that that I'm gonna to get to. So imagine us, 1.30, I don't know, we get back from Nashville. We land in Newark. We get to the rink. We pull up to the bus or out of the bus, you know, you're going under to whatever, get your luggage. There's one 6566 six, six long arm guy who's under there pulling bags out for the trainers, pulling equipment bags, pulling bags. He's got two bags on this shoulder, two bags on that shoulder. You know who that was? The oh. great Larry Robinson. Wow. Now, you know how many Stanley Cups Larry Robinson's won? And for Larry to have won that many Stanley Cups is one of the best players that's ever played. Is one of the best defensemen that's ever played as a member of the Montreal Canadiens for as long as he was, going to the LA Kings and still a great defenseman, molding a young Rob Blake at that stage of his career. And to have won all those cups behind the bench as a head coach with the Devils, assistant coach with the Devils, and last year just won as assistant coach with the St. Louis Blues again. Another one. All service. He doesn't lift bags. He doesn't have to touch a bag. He... Are you kidding me? Of, of anybody. He didn't have to touch any bags. And he's underneath there grabbing bags, pulling bags. I got it. Helping the equipment trainers. Skippy and Bobby and the greats that we had down at Wally back in the day. 
but you know, down in, in Carolina that are still there and Bobby and, and uh, Skip, he's right there with them, helping them. The great Larry Robinson. That's what I mean. So it doesn't have to be phony. Somebody's going to say, oh, it's a brown nose. It's phony. No, 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 no. It's just realizing like the great, the great Wayne Gretzky says, um, and Gretz always says, and I echo this all the time, and I quote him, everything my family and I have, we owe to the great game. And I think if you have that type of a mindset, at least a basis of framework and point of view in whatever you do, you can't go wrong. That gives you a strong enough foundation to then base everything off. Whether you're in law enforcement, we're here to serve. It's to serve and protect, which is, and so many of them are great. And I have, my uncle's been the head of an under, undercover drug squad in a major city here in New York for years, or sorry, in New York, in North America, excuse me, for years. So I just spoke to one NHL head of security yesterday who he was, anyway, he worked in New York City for years. He works in another spot now. And he's like, Kev, I just, I, we have so many good people on the force and these knuckleheads are really upsetting me. I'm crying here as I see what's going on. So those are some of the bad apples that are out there. And like anything, you, you need to punish them, train them and or get rid of them. But all of that to say, and whatever it is you're doing, which is why I love so much about the military as I come back to is just being of service and hospitality and the service industry. So that goes across all things for me. And if you have that mentality, you really can't go wrong. Wow. And just to, well, you put the bow around everything to put a, a bow around your bow, because mm-hmm. when you mention you, I'm going to, again, I will carry this with me because again, service, mm-hmm. I go back to you sharing this unbelievably personal story that now I can see mm-hmm. you and your, your late friend with the, the basketball PE coach. Mm-hmm. We are all, we all know it because we want to be accountable human beings. We are sure. responsible for our own choices. We're responsible to do the next right thing. Even if we haven't been given good guidance, we're still responsible for that. Sure. However, service gives humans a chance and gives the person, a Larry Robinson, a Luke Lamorello that you just mentioned, um, those that, that serve and protect, it gives you a chance that somebody's going to come to you later on, Kevin Weeks, years later, and say, you know, you may have forgotten this moment, but this moment was central in shaping who I am and mm-hmm. what I turned out to be. Mm-hmm. If, you go the other ne- if you go the other negative yeah. route, that's why I say you have no chance. Totally. Service gives you a chance. We're all 100% responsible for what we do. Sure. In terms of doing the next right thing and making good choices, and more importantly, uh, following uh, with a, a, a true good action plan. Mm-hmm. But service gives you a chance that somebody might come back to you down the road and say, hey, you may not remember this, but this is what you told me, and this is how powerful it was to my journey. Big time. I mean, listen, there, there's some people, and I'll start off with this segment of the knucklehead segment, where – You bring them to Venice Beach, and they're going to say the beach is too beachy. You bring them to Beverly Hills, they're going to say the Beverly is too Beverly-ish. You you bring them the freshest salmon, they're going to say, hey, it's too salmon-y. Some people, and I've had this before, and I've, it's so frustrating, but no matter how, what, there's always a yeah, but. Yeah, well, yeah, but. So there's a segment of that population that are just knuckleheads, no matter what you do and how you, how you try, they just can't get out of their own way. And they're just convicted in what they believe in and they're crooked, they're shady, whatever it is, they're just lost, whatever it is, unhappy. But for the vast majority of people that are out there, you're right. And I know this for a fact, like Tripper, you know, this, think of the people that you would have signed autographs for after a Canes game or, You talk about Kaniacs that are traveling and you see them on one of the stops along the way on the road, or you see them at the team hotel on the road and you acknowledge them and you take a picture and then who knows, maybe next thing you know, 15 years later in your amazing journey that you've had so far, uh, that person is, is the director on your show on Fox sports Carolinas. You don't know, you know, and I've had that in more than enough instances where there are people that 
you know, you give a, a, an autograph stick to a fan post game. There's a kid that comes to a pregame skate. You know, I've seen that with some of those people that now work at the NHL level. I've seen it with people that I, pl- I ended up playing with or I ended up playing against. Mike Zygamanis, Anson Carter, and I used to be in the gym at the Good Life Fitness uh, in the same building that my mom worked in uh, at, Blue- at Blue Cross and Jimmy Rutherford's sister at the time worked in. This is the small world. Yeah. And Anson and I are in the NHL and we're training in squats and plyos and bench press and cardio and all these different things and there's a little young Mike Zigamanis in there little bobblehead Ziggy and you know he was just going into Kingston the OHL at the time and we're talking to him and frick man what was it five years later he's playing with me on the Canes you know what I mean and it's not all about making the NHL or making the NBA or running track in the Olympics or whatever it is Uh, you know there's so many different avenues for a lot of these young girls and boys and you know, last, for example, Jaina Hefford, who played for Team Canada women's team. I remember sometimes Sudsy and I would be on the ice in the summer. We couldn't get a shooter. Sometimes Camilleri's out there. Sometimes it would have been uh, Dustin Penner or this person or Luciano Aquino or this person, that person. And other times, Jaina Hefford, she's like, I'm here to shoot. I'll shoot. And next thing you know, she not only goes on to play, you know, all those different Olympics for Team Canada, uh, women's hockey team, but she's a hockey hall of famer, you know, and then we're at all-star weekend in, uh, in St. And sorry, in San and yeah, St. Louis this year, earlier in January. And who do I see there who comes up and says, hello, Jana Hefford. And I'm like, Jana, man, long way from shooting on me, huh? You know, so that just goes to show you, right. The, the power of infinite possibilities when to your point tripper, when you operate that way, and how that can touch somebody. You know, you don't know if somebody could be going through the loss of a loved one or, uh, you know, a a dissolution of a marriage, a spouse, maybe a a miscarriage. I mean, there's real life things, right? Or maybe feeling dissuaded on one career path and you have a chance to interact with them and they go down a different career path and somehow you were able to give them a little boost. But when when you operate from that perspective, at least more often than not, as you said, you always at least have a chance than than the opposite for sure. Service can save lives. Yes. Yeah. Could have been the case with your late friend. And it, gives those, and it gives those special moments a chance. So why totally. not, why not think, why not go all in on service? I mean, yeah. that's, that's the right way to dig in. I want to, I thank you again for, wow, for sharing that. And now I want to, I've got to, I want to segue into, um, you yeah. just mentioned our dear friend, the great Jim Rutherford. Yeah. Uh, Hall of Fame general manager and, and builder. Totally. Yeah. Um, there are rumors right now. And yeah. I have long said to you, so, you know, and I, the old Mark Twain, you don't have to have a good memory when you tell the truth. I could yeah, go well said, through yeah. a, I could go through the boxes A through Z, why you will flourish as a general manager in the National Hockey League. And I think I've been around long enough to know what makes a good GM. Um, and I won't bore you all those different, uh, all those different <laughs> elements right now, but they are, they're deep, they're thorough. Thank you. Uh, you, there are some managerial positions open. Um, you can take this and go with it where you may. Um, are you interested? Are you involved? Um, because I think you would, be at the true top of my list you'd be on the summit of mount everest if any team was looking for a general manager well first of all thank you for that bro thanks so much um let me qualify it this way you see and i'm sure the nhl fans that tune in and watch us on the nhl network or see it watch us here on digging in with you or on any platform how passionate i am about the game and how much i love the game and live the game i'm a rink rat at heart so you know i've had the different the different times of having 10 cents in my pocket at the rink. Am I going to go to the gumball machine, 25 cents? Am I going to play super checks, bubble hockey, you know, $10, $5, making $35 a week junior being in the minors, being in the NHL and everything in between. So, and then broadcasting. And I love that. I love broadcasting. I'm, I'm very passionate about it. You know how often I'm on TV, which is, as now more than any hockey analyst in the world right now, as far as television work, I love it. I love the craft. I'm very passionate about that. I also, every year, 
keep in mind, we went to the Stanley Cup final in 02. As you know, Tripper, you're one of the great voices of the Canes. And we ended up losing that one. Didn't get a Stanley Cup ring. So since then, in broadcasting, I've earned the right to do the last 10 Stanley Cups, which, as you know, we have so many great friends that are competing in them. It's a firsthand being in a first-hand lab between those two teams that get to the cup final for the last 10 years. Some of them have been there multiple times, obviously, in L.A. and Pitt and, uh, and Chicago. But all that to say, there's one team that's spraying champagne at the end. And if uh, an opportunity presented itself that made enough sense for us as a family and that made great sense and, you know, the ownership was really committed to, to greatness and it was a match – and I say that greatness, not because they're in a position to own the team, but committed to wanting to have the best team possible with all their resources and the infrastructure. And if it made sense and it ticked all those boxes, uh, then it's something that we certainly have to look at for sure. And yeah, as it's been reported, there have been some interviews, several, and it's been interesting going through that process and what that looks like. But the idea for me of being a part of a great group if all those boxes are ticked and being able to build something collectively with people that number one starts with people and, you know, really highlights people development and good people in an organization by choice, both on the playing and non-playing side and, and valuing the fans and going from there. And then all the other different elements of what that looked like from people development to player development, to athlete care, sports science, and all of that in pursuit of trying to, to get the ultimate prize with a great group of people, then that's something that I'm in the right circumstance that I'll, I'll certainly continue to, to entertain if everything aligns and it ticks those boxes. But uh, nothing has really manifested fully to this point. I know there's been a lot reported, but nothing has been manifested fully. Uh, all that is kind of uh, fluid. And I'll just continue to be open to, to whatever great opportunity. And for me, I can either continue on my current path of media, which I love, as you can see, as do you. And we're so passionate about this because we love the sport, but we also love the platform. We love people. We love connecting with people. So I can either continue on this path, hockey plus, I don't know, lifestyle or something else, or more hockey or all hockey through media and or pivot if the opportunity makes sense to be able to uh, – to transition into, into a, a senior executive managerial role, be it a team president and or president of hockey ops slash general manager type thing. So that's kind of where that stands at press time. Well, I wasn't going to go here because I, but I have to, I mean, just very quickly uh, sure. with regards to uh, why, because we do have a lot of uh, general managers that watch this show uh, yep. and um, we just, you know, uh, we dug in with Pete DeBoer last week. We're, we are going to awesome. dig in. We yeah. are going to dig in with our mutual dear friend, Paul Maurice, on Love Wednesday it. morning. So that should be out My later man. this week. So why Kevin Weeks? Uh, and um, a guy here that at times has diarrhea of the mouth. Let's see if I can land this plane. <laughs> Let's see if I can land this plane quickly. Okay. Uh. First of all, uh, there are three kinds of people in this world. A, people that always get it. B, people that learn a hard lesson and then they get it. And C, people that never get it. I'm trying to focus on being a B, not a C. You are a flat out A plus. You've always oh, gotten it. You. Uh, you, uh, and you talked about Michael Jordan, steady as the day is long with regards to detail. Your detail, seven days a week, 24-7, uh, from hmm. month to month and year to year, never wavers. You are always in a position of strength with your preparation and execution in life. Um, you. You, you have flat out, um, beyond decent and genuine character. You're an unwavering friend, specifically in the game of hockey. Mm, there, are very you, few, are you. there are very few people that I can go to to ask about the tendencies of a player, past or present, and all the idiosyncrasies of that given player, not just in the National Hockey League, in any league at any level on planet Earth. You have that reach, you have that dedication, you have that complete nature to being a true hockey guy. So 
you know, and oftentimes it's on the bike when my heart rate uh, is I'm trying to look like Rod the Bod, you know, but I'm asking, I'm, asking, I'm, I'm asking you about a given player, and I know yeah. that a player could be playing in a developmental league on the moon, and you'd be able to tell me uh, what makes this player unique. Furthermore, you know what is a winner, and you know what is a, uh, a wannabe. Um, uh, you would use analytics as a resource, but you still would recognize you win with heart, you win with team chemistry, and so I believe it would be a proper resource. Um, beyond that, I, I can't imagine I, I'll ever hear it again talking about having 10 cents or whatever you said and figuring out how to maximize that 10 cents and if you go to the gumball machine and partake. That in, in a cap world, you can't, you know, you can ruin your organization if you have one bad contract. So yep. all of, and you treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, all of these reasons, I hope I said it, maybe 5% as eloquently partner as you always talk. These are the reasons you would be on the summit. Plant, I'd be planting the Kevin Weeks flag uh, for a general manager job. Well, thank you so much. I, I'll just, you know, I, I come back to, you know, Tripper, we're, we're rink rats, right? Like, and I, you often see me and for the fans that follow us on social and you all, you'll often hear me say rink rats get the cheese. And, you know, I think, you know, we talked about Jordan earlier, like the gym rat that he was and is um, the business rat that he is and has become and, you know, success leaves clues, right? So there's so much that we've been fortunate enough to learn from the great people we've been around, you know, be it Rod Brindamore, be it, Jim Rutherford, uh, Glenn Sather for me, Henrik Lundqvist, all these different people, Luongo. I mean, there's so many people that I can mention, Brad Richards, Marty St. Louis, and even players that were maybe less heralded, but that had outstanding careers and people too, like that just had a consistency about them, that had a decency about them. And I know for you and I, that starts at home, uh, including your late dad. So God bless his soul. But you know, our family units and, and what that's meant and what that means to us. So we, we grew up with that naturally. So that certainly helps. But in addition to that, it's that wiring and, and that will and that commitment to, to want to accomplish big things, right? And, you know, for me, it's all the hockey card books, all the sticker books. And again, making those decisions, going to a convenience store, Dominic's convenience store back in Toronto, like, okay, it's 35 cents. So I get hockey cards and a double bubble or, you know what I mean? Like, and thinking about those things, but as, as even now, Tripper, like think about as much time as, as you and I spend as, as the amazing friends we are, but you're always breaking the game down. We're always breaking the game down. And it is really, a lot of it is about being hyper-connected and, and putting in the time to nurture those relationships. But in addition to that is access to real time, trusted information and doing the work quite frankly, you know, you look at all these games you call and you look at all the things that you're doing here, uh, expanding your connection to the fans and, and to the viewers and the players and, you know, the trusted relationships that you have in your Rolodex, which help arm you to be great and as great as you are in what you do. And, you know, for me, that's, you know, we, we, we sing from the same songbook where that's concerned, but on a, on a day to day, like you, it's, a conversation with a friend of mine that's coaching in the KHL in Russia to then flip to his brother that's over in, in Germany. And these are guys I grew up with to then flip to um, French John, the goalie coach of the Tampa Bay lightning, who's had five Vesna trophy finalists in the last seven years. Yeah. As an example with Vasilevsky again this year, you know what I mean? To James Boyd in Ottawa with the 67s, my old OHL team, from my last year in junior, who I played with there, who's a GM, who was OHL GM of the year, and asking him, hey, what about this player? What about that player? What did you think when you guys played against him? Did you like him? I see he's projected to go whatever number. Tell me what you think about him. So, and, and the willingness to just roll your sleeves up, right? And not to be, uh, you know, an arm. I always say being in the ivory tower. I always joke around with senior executives and stuff and, you know, somebody in this house is already a senior executive and in a C-suite, and it's not me. But I joke around about that. <laughs> I joke around, and it's not our cat, Vlad, but I joke around about that a lot. 
And, but no, the reality is the people that are very adept at that, like you mentioned, Jimmy and the other people, they work exceptionally hard and you've got to put that time in. And so I did that as a player. I do that as a broadcaster analyst now. And if things manifest to where it goes in that direction, I would, I would approach it with that same respect that I had as a player that I do that I applied to broadcasting with anything else down the line and business. It's, and for those, uh, you know, wondering, uh, well, watching on YouTube, two things, you talk about rolling up your sleeves. Those yeah. watching, you, you have your sleeves rolled up. I mean, it's just, <laughs> to you. me, I've got, me, I've got uh. no sleeves because I've got the gun show. But, uh, <laughs> uh. And, and, and now, uh. now yeah. for the trifecta, because yeah. hopefully if it does match up, because wow, what a, a pristine spectacular choice it would be by any hockey club to make you their general manager, perhaps president too, you then would be in the C-suite, as we call it. Exactly. And that's what right. a group yeah. text, and that's what we always uh, joke, Kevin and I, with Rod Brindamore. Yeah. If, he, if he ever goes silent, we say he's, he's, you know what, he's not, he's changed. He's up in yeah, the C-suite. Totally. <laughs> he's enjoying the crab. He's enjoying the crab claws up there. In <laughs> In between the military press, he's enjoying he's in, enjoying the crab claws and the lobster bisque up there. That's what, yeah. that's, that's what we joke about. <laughs> oh, you're going to – and, of uh, course, the C-suite is the corporate yeah. suite. So Correct. So you could end up in the C-suite. By the way, um, we're going to get a, a – you know, go around the National Hockey League right now. But sure. Adam Holtzman, our producer, if you could do one thing and then you can maybe unmute yourself uh, between questions – when you mentioned, uh, in talking about service, Elvis Merzlikens and Lugano, yeah. Adam, yeah. can you fact check? Did did Rod, the C-suite, Bod, Brindamore play <laughs> in Lugano for a few games during the 04-05 lockout? I know he played in Switzerland. Uh, can you fact check that for us, Adam, and then unmute yourself and report back? I um, love it. Now, let's dig in around the league. Uh, what do you got? Let's see. Uh, Talk to let's, him. Let's Okay, let's start. Biggest takeaway so far, uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning uh, up 3-1 on yeah. the Boston Bruins. Biggest takeaway in that right now is the Boston Bruins, if we start with them since they, they went to the Stanley Cup final and lost in a game seven last year. But they were the top club in the league this year in the regular season prior to the pause, and they were having an amazing season. A few different things. The, the Tukaras situation has been a challenge for them by way of what happened in him opting out. But I, I know prior to that, it just, it didn't seem to be uh, just harmonious for him. The, the, the fit of the bubble and the thought of returning, it just wasn't where he felt comfortable. So all that to say, you know, that's a personal decision. You certainly have to respect that. So too do the bees, but that, that was a challenge for them. But Yarrow Halak is more than capable. He's played so well for them overall. He's played well now. They'll need him to be great. Uh, in this one, if they have a chance. But also for the Bees, what's been interesting is their bottom six have dried up too in terms of production. And Corrali, when he got injured, that doesn't help them. But uh, they, they've lost that production out of their bottom six forward group, and that's really hurt them. So the onus is really on four players. That spectacular top line that's arguably, on any given night, the best line in the league with that of Colorado's top line, or even Dallas is the way they're going again. And plus one being David Krejci. So that, that production has fallen on four players for, for the Boston Bruins offensively. And on the opposite side of that matchup, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning are, they have added more dimensions and namely the dimension of grit and, and sandiness to their team, mm -hmm. which they sorely needed, as you know, Tripper. We know they have elite skill. Keep in mind their captain, Steven Samkos, isn't even playing. Yep. And we know they have elite skill. We know that they can electrify you offensively. Braden Point right now is neck and neck with Nate McKinnon right now for the two best players in the league here that are remaining in the bubble and in general. He's been amazing, Braden Point. That his line has been money with him, Kucherov, and Palat. But I think what's also driving that bus in Tampa are the acquisitions of those aforementioned sandpaper, gritty, sandy type players like Blake Coleman and Barclay Goudreau and Patty Maroon, Stanley Cup winner from last year. And even on the back end, Zach Bogosian, the veteran, has been very nice for them. So they've added more jam to their team. They're not as much 
a skill, pure skill team. Now they're more balanced between their skill and what was lacking for them is their uh, tenacity and their bite and their sandiness. Bonus question on this series. If Tampa ends up winning, uh, do you think first ballot uh, future Hall of Famer, Famer Zidane Chara will have played his last game or does he continue to play? Man, I play with Z too and love him as a person and player. I think I haven't spoken to him about that. And I know it's been reported that that could be his last game in the event that they are eliminated. But knowing him, I don't know, he probably want to do the Chelly and play till he's like 47, do the Chris Chelios, play till he's 48. And he's capable of doing it. Um, and if I had to hedge, I would say 60, 40, he plays versus retires. But that's not on the basis of any inside information from speaking to him. That's just me sitting here at the kitchen island and uh, you and I having the great time that we are on, on digging in with Tripper. Okay, uh, good intel. It's, it's not intel, but uh, that's feel. That's feel. Yeah, that's my and, feel. And along, along mm -hmm. the lines of Tampa, that's what we talked about again, why you would be my general manager, because being able to deal with advanced statistics, analytics being an excellent resource, but then recognizing you need more sandpaper. You got to be harder to play against. You mentioned that progression, a positive one for Tampa. Uh, as we move to um, the New York Islanders up 3-1 on Philadelphia. Our producer, Adam Holtzman, is a closet fisherman fan. Uh, mm. Adam, have you figured out the battle with uh, Rod Rendemore? Yeah, buddy. To answer your question, he played for Clotten in 4 5 in the Swiss League. Two goals, yeah. one helper in two games. Nice. Okay, okay. so it was, was in the – I, yeah. I, I knew it was on the Swiss elite, in the Swiss Elite League because uh, we've shared many conversations – about uh, what a nice flight over he had on Swiss Air in the in the C-suite. <laughs> of course it would be. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, that's fitting. That's fitting. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Islanders. Uh, uh, yeah. the Islanders in Philadelphia. Uh, if we lead with Philly, just just it's been an amazing transformation of their team from where they were last year till now. I have to say, and I got to give them a lot of credit. And Chuck Fletcher's done an outstanding job there. He, um, he was in, with the Florida Panthers when I first came into the league. So, and, and they drafted me, and he was a part of that process. So always big ups to Chuck for that, and, and thanks to him for that. But I would say their team, Tripper, they've, you know, starting in the net, obviously, with Carter Hart, and they, they have the veteran and Brian Elliott, who played yesterday. And Brian Elliott was very good in that game, by the way. But the Moose, as he's known, Brian Elliott has done a great job of, of chipping in and playing and, and giving them a chance to win when he gets in the net but also helping to mentor that young stud that is Carter Hart. Carter Hart is already one of the top goalies in the league. For me, he's already inside the top 10, maybe even higher. And that's just changed everything for their, for their group. But also remember, they didn't have – their defense was kind of an Achilles heel for them. Not the case anymore. Now, Sanheim, Myers, I mean, I can go up and down. Their, their defense has improved immeasurably right now. The challenge for the Flyers, though, is I don't think as great as Kevin Hayes has been, he's been money for them. But Konechny has, has, has dried up his production, and he might have been their best player all season long in the regular season as far as their skaters go. But the fact that their top guys have, have kind of dried up in terms of their production, especially the captain, Claude Giroux, who's such a good player for them and such a great leader, and nobody's more frustrated than he is. But I think they're going to have a hard time beating the Islanders unless – him being Claude Drew and some of the other guys can get untracked. And, and they know that. He knows that. He puts that on himself. So that's my take on the Flyers right now. But what a turnaround. At the start of the year, sorry, early in the season, I said that they, they were a little reminiscent for me of the Canes last year. Yep. And I've been saying that the Flyers this year are what the Canes were last year. They started as disruptors. And as the season went along, they became contenders. And that's what I feel about their group. As far as the Islanders go, you know, I could sit here and you heard me talk about the great Lou Lamorello, their GM, and the great Barry Trotz, their coach. The whole coaching staff has done a masterful job. Semyon Varlamov came in um, with the departure of Robin Leonard, and Varlamov's been incredible for them, especially the playoffs. He's been one of the best goalies in the league here in the playoffs. And Thomas Grice is excellent. He's played very well all year. He was excellent yesterday in that game as well, making 36, I think it was, 36, 37 saves in their win. And just little subtle additions like the addition of my former teammate, Andy Green, who I played with here in Jersey, uh, adding him as a stabilizer, as a depth defenseman with leadership who can still contribute, by the way. I thought that was a great move by Lou Lamorello. Of course, it goes back to Andy Green 
being signed by Lou Lamorello coming out of college, right? At Miami of Ohio for my good buddy, Rico Blasi, who ran that program for years. So then up front, the addition of J.G. Paggio. Like J.G. Paggio, I think, has a, a goal in every other playoff game that he's played so far. Mm -hmm. And he's got seven so far in this postseason. So you put him in at the third line slot. Now they have an amazing four centers down the middle, that depth, so to speak. And the Killer Bees line for them, too, has been great for the Islanders. They've been awesome. Bailey Nelson and, and, you know, that entire line, those guys, Nelson got another two goals last night. So the Islanders, they play that lockdown D. As you know, Tripper, they're great defensively. They're committed to playing for the front of the jersey more so than the name on the back of it. There's a lot of sacrifice and, and their commitment to playing the system, and it's worked well for them. They, the Islanders, so, so yeah, Adam, if you're loving the fish sticks, uh, you got to be excited about what you're seeing right now. They've been great. The Islanders have been awesome. Oh, he, he spoons with his Islander teddy bear at night. <laughs> um, let's, 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 so, oh, that's too good. Let's, <laughs> let's sojourn out west. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's start yeah. with uh, the Dallas Stars. Wow. Uh, now, now 3 1 on the, all the weapons uh, that the Colorado Avalanche present. Uh, your biggest takeaways uh, through four games. Well, I mean, the Dallas Stars right now, I, I have to give a lot of credit to our good friend Rick Monis behind the bench. <laughs> You know, it was a tough situation for Jim Montgomery, who was doing a really nice job. And, um, you know, he he was relieved of his duties. And Jim Montgomery has, has done a lot to, to re-earn the trust of potentially having another opportunity. And, you know, he made some mistakes along the way, not unique to him. A lot of us have along the way in different respects. But uh, Bones, as he's known, Rick Bonus, who's been behind an NHL bench more than any coach in NHL history, as I've heard you mention before, Tripper. Uh, he's come in and just masterful behind the bench. You know, his disposition, his demeanor, his calm, his zen. And we talked about the ability to relate to people, players as people. And he just mm -hmm. does an incredible job of that. So no panic, even when they were down to Calgary 2-1. No panic, cool, chill. And now they're top line. They're reunited and they're, they're on fuego right now. Those guys look awesome with Ben Sagan and, and Radulov. Now they look like they did two years ago. Mm -hmm. Miro Haskinen, their young Finnish defenseman, is a stud. Uh, All-star already. Came in the league at 18. All-star. I think he's a superstar defenseman. 16 points already so far here in the postseason. And they're getting production. They have more points from their blue line than any team remaining right now in the final eight. So they're getting production from the defense. All four lines, Radic Fax as a depth forward has been involved in the offense, to name a few, a few others that have played really well. And now I look at that series, I'm like, wow, they certainly have that, that series in hand. And Colorado, who's so good this year, by the way, and so mm -hmm. much more depth. Prior to last night's game, in a head scratcher, Colorado hasn't had any production out of their bottom six either, which is weird because they have good players playing in those roles. And I got to give Joe Sackett credit, like based on his roster composition this off season, nobody's done more than Joe Sackett to fill those holes in depth. But here's one thing about Colorado, as great as McKinnon is and Kale McCarr is. And one thing about Colorado that I don't hear people talking about enough is the injury to Eric Johnson on their back end. Uh, yeah. Good I talk. think that's really impacted them uh, negatively because He's mobile, he's big, he's rangy, he's physical, and he brings a lot of leadership. And so too does Eric Cole, having won cups. But I think the size difference of Johnson and his tenacity and his, his, his physicality goes a long way in their group. And I feel like when he's in the lineup, they're a different team. That's been a big miss for them in having him out due to injury. Yeah, I, boy, I did a series several years ago for uh, – for NBC, and it was it was Colorado, and it was uh, Minnesota at the time. Right. And so just following Eric Johnson and being there, you know, at ice level. Sure. He, he he's a huge piece. I mean, he isn't your classic first overall pick, you know, going back to when he was right. taken first overall by St. Louis, but he is invaluable to that team, Weeksy. Yes. Um, and he's egoless too. You talked about the Islanders, the fact it's more it's more about the front of the jersey than the back. I think Eric Johnson embodies that. Yeah, um, big time. Loved what you said about Rick Bonus, Mr. Corvette. Who wouldn't be cool? Yeah, exactly. Although I'm, as you know, I'm a Ford guy. I'm going to have to I, have this conversation with Bones. Yeah. Get him out of those vets. He's a huge vet guru. Uh, <laughs> finally, 
Yeah. Finally, uh, our last digging in guest, the great Pete DeBoer and his Vegas Golden Knights, up oh, 3 man. 1 on a heck of a young story in the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, what do you take away from that series uh, again through four? Well, let's start with Van and, and give them so much credit as, as I've been doing on the NHL network. I mean, they're a team that's also ahead of schedule. Travis Green has done an outstanding job as a, as a head coach, you know, going back to his time as an assistant in Portland with the Winter Hawks in the WHL. And then, uh, you know, he got the chance to be a head coach there temporarily too. When Mike Johnson, uh, if I believe they had a sanction against Portland, their head coach, Mike Johnson, and Travis Green became the head. Then he went to the American League and climbed the coaching tree in Utica, helped them get to a Calder Cup final with that group. And that group had Jacob Markstrom in the net, if you remember, who's playing for Vancouver in NHL All-Star this year. So all that to say, uh, their player development and their scouts deserve a lot of credit. Uh, their GM also deserves a lot of credit. And Jim Benning grew up watching him when he played for the Leafs as, when I was a young kid. But uh, our good buddy, RJ, Ryan Johnson, who, you know, he's, he's worked so hard. We played together, Tripper. He's, he's, such, he's such a character. Beautician. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Right? We, we oh man, we love. Oh, boy, RJ. He, you're right. Hey, he yeah. RJ worked his tail off. Totally, man. Always he attention was built to detail. On work. Totally he was attention built on to work. detail. As a player, you being a teammate yeah. with them, attention to detail in uh, in a managerial capacity, player development. He runs their AHL team as well down in Utica, and has done an amazing job. Consider this when you think of the Canucks, right? The last three years, for like, look at how great Bo Hor Horvat's been as their captain, right? Yeah. This year in the postseason he's having with nine goals to lead the postseason. But also think of three Calder Trophy finalists for Rookie of the Year in the last three years, including somebody that played at University of Michigan, which you're probably proud of, and Quint, the great Quinn Hughes, their young defenseman, who's awesome, by the yeah. way. So he is a Calder Trophy finalist this year. So three consecutive years – and for them to be where they are right now is really a testament to all those things we talked about. So I got to give Van a world of credit in their group. And then Vegas Golden Knights, uh, listen, from when, from when I heard they were getting the team to the NHL awards in Vegas, backslash, following the awards, to the expansion draft, to the first time I met their owner, the great Bill Foley, their majority owner, to speaking to him backstage about what his vision was for the team, Everything he said is everything they've done. And we got to give George McPhee a world of credit. Gerard Gallant, we know he's not there anymore. We give him a lot of credit for what he was able to do with the group. Uh, Kelly McCrimmon now in, in conjunction with George McPhee and Pete DeBoer and the staff and Spotter. Remember, Pete DeBoer, when they hired Pete DeBoer, I want you to remember earlier in the year, you remember he had to meet them in Ottawa, I believe, on the road. He met the team. Yeah. And he didn't even have a suit handy at the time. You remember this? Yeah. Yeah, and oh, yeah. Steve, Steve Spot, Spotter, his assistant, a longtime assistant since their days in, in Kitchener in the OHL. Yeah. Spotter drove him uh, east on Highway 401 and drove him up to Ottawa. And he had to go shop in the mall and, and buy a couple suits, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And it's from there to now, for what Pete's been able to do with their group, and he was a great guest of yours here on, uh, on, on Digging In With You, and we've had him on the NHL Network several times. Uh, they've done an amazing job, man. Like, the depth that they have, all four lines, that Ryan Reeves line is amazing. Chandler yep. Stevenson on the fourth slash third line has been great. Shea Theodore has become an elite defenseman on the, in the league. I mean, they're stacked with Ferrari A or Ferrari B or Lamborghini B, I should say, and, and Marc-Andre Fleury and Robin Leonard. So uh, they're just a stacked team. They really are. And they've got Vancouver on the ropes, but I give Van a lot of credit and yeah. Vegas, everything that they said they were going to be is exactly what they are. And that's a testament to everyone in that organization, really. <sighs> Impeccably good stuff. A couple of takeaways. Uh, first of all, on the Vancouver side, I'm very happy you plugged Ryan Johnson. Very oh, uh, awesome. serving he is. And yeah. what it makes, I, you know, because I roomed with him in the American League before the yeah. two of you uh, played together in the NHL. And I will leave it at, and maybe I'll send him this clip. He and I, in those days, he and I really had a thing for Shania Twain. Right. Uh, so shifting gears, that'll, that'll give him a nice smile. Awesome. Thunder Bay native. <laughs> Thunder Bay native. Yep. Um, anyways, uh, moving over to the Vegas side of things, I'm glad that Steve Spot 
uh, this is uh, Pete's fine assistant coach, Plymouth, Kitchener, everywhere he's been in the NHL. I'm glad right. that Spotter did not loan Pete one of his suits because <laughs> they have quite different frames. <laughs> and then, and then finally, yeah. the great George McPhee, who's going to dig again yeah. in the next couple of weeks That'd here on the show. I, yeah. I have found George to be an extraordinarily charismatic person over the years, but has sure. never gotten enough credit, yeah. even though Vegas lost to Washington the Stanley Cup. Yeah. What a job building that team in Washington to be good for a generation. You know, Very well said. I've seen teams miss on a lot of first-round picks. And George did miss on many picks, period. Yeah, uh, that's true. And then, and then what he's done to hit the ground running, and now with Kelly McCrimmon uh, under the, the ownership of Bill Foley. So looking forward to digging in with George. Two more things. Sure. Uh, my man. What so, do you got? Yeah, well, what do you got? Columbus took a chance when he sailed the ocean blue. So I'm going to ask <laughs> you, is the great Shady AP willing to take a chance and – Pick which team comes out of the West, comes out of the East, and who wins Lord Stanley's Cup. Coming out of the West, I'm going to roll with Vegas now. And coming out of the East, I'm 50-50 on this one. I love where Tampa's at something tells me it's going to be the Islanders if they stay healthy coming out of the East. What do you, what do you got one of the whole thing? I then have Vegas winning in six. Is this why you've got, you know, the friends that, uh, you know, if you're lucky if you have, you know, enough friends to fill fingers on one hand, you grab the thumb. If you think you got more, you're not even stupid, but uh, that's why you got the thumb. I got Vegas too. Do you? Yeah. Too. Yeah. Now that St. Um, Louis is gone, and uh, and now that Colorado's slipping, uh, I'll I'll go Vegas for sure. And they're a cup contender, anyways, man. But they're deeper. You've heard you trip. I've heard you say this, and I've echoed the same thing. They're deeper than their inaugural season when they went to the Stanley Cup final. This team is even better and even deeper than that one. They are, and uh, you know now that everybody uh, now that. Uh, Pete DeBoer said that uh, what's not to like in the bubble, you get to watch uh, unlimited hockey and drink unlimited beer. I'm digging in. I'm digging in. He said if they win the cup, he's going to send me a case of his favorite beer. I forget the name of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you and I aren't really beer guys, but, you know, for the nah. great beer, Pete DeBoer, we could dig in. Of um, course. Of course. We'd celebrate so, him for that, him and Spotter and, and, and their group. They got a great group, Tripper. You know that. Oh, Those guys are awesome people there. They've got a – First-class class. operation in every sense of the word. You know that, too. World-class. World-class yeah. group. Um, beyond world-class. I mean, George McPhee, he, he, he dig in with us, too, as well. And um, Absolutely. <laughs> so I'd love to hear some of George's stories and get a little bit of his wisdom, too. He's been around a long time, man. Done an amazing you job. you know, I'll share the, the, one of my first years in the league. I was up in uh, Mount Tremblant yep. at our broadcast meetings, and there was some local bar. It was called La Puck. Yeah. And I was so, I mean, I got this job. So Ironically. I, had to be 20, I had to be 24, 25. That's amazing, and, Tripper, and by I, the way. Yeah, yeah. And I saw it, you know, I was having a few and, and I was, you know, a little bit intimidated actually at that point to walk up to guys, whether, you know, like in, sure. there are a couple of tables away were, uh, you know, George McPhee, of course, managing yeah. the caps at that point and, and Craig Patrick managing the Pittsburgh Penguins. Sure. And I, as I was, you know, sipping on something, I remember saying to myself, those are two cool, uh, cool cats. Yeah. And, uh, and over the course of time, both of us, I mean, built a rapport with uh, George. And he's mm -hmm. one of the great ones on and off the ice, at the rink, away from the rink. Wonderful human being. And I think a, an extremely underrated mm -hmm. manager in this league. And oh, as yeah. A what a job he's done. Yeah, amazing. Amazing job. And you know what I liked about George and I, and I love about him is the fact that, you know, if, as we've had these conversations, you know, there's some there have been some people that have been on the cutting edge of open mindedness. And, you know, we talked about this earlier in the show here. Uh, the great Glenn Sather for me was always on that cutting edge. You look at his Oilers teams. They were always multinational, multicultural, different parts of the color wheel would represent the players. Um, Jim Rutherford has always been that. Lou Lamorello's always been that. But 
George McPhee has always been that too. You look at his, you look at his different Caps teams, you know, he embraced American players, different color, last name American players, Canadian, European players, it didn't matter. And the same thing for Vegas. You look at their roster now. So uh, he's always had that worldly, worldliness about him and certainly being a, a, a black person and, and a black man, I, I, I really respect that about him a lot. He's had that open-mindedness and that goes a long way for sure. Because without that, then some people can get marginalized in terms of opportunity. And to your point, they haven't missed on very many picks. But imagine if they didn't have that open-mindedness, maybe some of those picks they miss on for the wrong reasons, right? Right on, mm -hmm. right on. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, listen, I got to do this now because it'll mean a lot to him. Uh, we'll send him this clip. You yeah. mentioned Jimmy Who Rutherford. Is this? <laughs> uh, let's, let's both, let's, you know, he's a big dig in fan. He, he's going to yeah. dig in, he's going to dig in deep. Um, do you want to tell your favorite, because this man, aside from being a Hall of Fame builder, <laughs> general manager, he's in the Hall. Yeah. He has an underrated, grossly underrated sense of humor. Uh, Give me your favorite Jim Rutherford story, or if you want me to go first, you tell me. Let's both uh, let's both dig in with one and sh send it to him. All right. So I'm talking to Jimmy. Was it last week or week before? We're speaking on some some unrelated hockey matters, and he's always such an amazing supporter and a great resource. So I call him on a matter and several matters, but one specifically. And he's open minded as he is, and he's listening, and we're talking and. Uh, you know, I'm getting his great counsel and his, his attention and his hockey IQ and stuff and experience. So at the end of it, he's like, Weeksy, I don't know. I see some of these other guys. You usually have some really nice suits. I see some of these other guys. They're not too far behind. Anson's looking really sharp on NBC. Patrick, Patrick Sharp. He's living up to his last name on NBC. I don't know. You've always had the crown, but I'm not sure. You got to step your game up. So that 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 that's just like hot off the press because that is that one's that one's from last week, if I'm not mistaken. And I got off the phone. I was at NHL Network, and uh, I got off the phone with him. I was howling. I was literally howling because it's so him. Yeah, it's so him. So so that would be one that's appropriate for our platform right now that I could share. Oh, that's a doozy. OK, yeah. I'm going to try to yeah. this. This was a preseason road trip with yeah. J.I. OK, yeah. with the Hurricanes. So we start out in Buffalo. OK, mm -hmm. and uh, mind you, during the 0405 lockout, Jimmy, you know, gave me great advice throughout uh, my time uh, with him being my president and general manager, more importantly, oh. my friend. And yep, so one 100%. of the things he did during that lockout, he said, Tripp, I want you to go and have a cup of coffee with Harry Neal. I think it'll be helpful to your broadcast career. He did the same thing with, with uh, the great John Shannon. So, but, oh, so that's I, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Love two, John two, Shannon, too. Two, awesome. two, two absolute giants in yes. broadcasting that have changed mm -hmm. my career. And Jimmy's responsible for that. So anyway, mm -hmm. so, you know, I get to know Harry because of Jimmy. And Harry, wow, what a yeah. humor. So yeah. we're, we're, we're in Buffalo for this preseason game. And I go see Harry because it's not on television. He's there, but he's not working in Buffalo. And yeah. he says, uh, Trip, he said, have you ever heard of this one? And Nathan Gerby, a former Sabre, wow, so happy to see him play well for a was one of, the, one of the great guys in the game. And he earns every shift he ever gets. Under eight, Rod Brindamore always loved him. So, yeah. Anyways, Harry says to me between periods, he goes, you know, Tripp, and, and Gerbs would enjoy this. Harry mm. goes, you know, Tripp, Nathan Gerby might be the only player that had a concussion that was a lower body injury. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, because if, for those watching on YouTube and oh, listening, I think, what is funny. Gerbs? Is, is Gerbs 5'4"? <laughs> yeah, 5'5", <laughs> okay. yeah. 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 Okay. He could be on so the gymnastic Harry team for sure. And yeah, I love so him too because I, I love his game and I love oh, his work ethic. Love, love yeah, his me game. too. Love yep. his game. Love his family. He's yes. a pure Michigander. Anyway, yeah. so the Canes get pummeled in Buffalo, so I can't tell Jimmy this joke. And and just to, to give everybody perspective, Jimmy is very intense, <laughs> yes. and there are probably two people in the hockey world that could go into his C-suite <laughs> during his corporate suite during the game. 
maybe three. His longtime agent and friend, Rick Curran, yep. Bobby Orr, Shan John Shannon might be able to get away with it, Harry Neal. Okay, that's it. Right. There ain't no more, right. and I might have stretched that too far. All right? So <laughs> Jimmy very tight with Harry. So I'm dying to tell uh, Jimmy this line, you know, about, you know, a concussion being a lower body injury. We get Holy The shit. Hurricanes get pummeled in Buffalo. We go to Quebec, neutral site game against the Canadians. Pummeled. Yep. Jimmy's bus driver with half the team loses, a, 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 can't find his way to the airport. Okay. <laughs> so now he's got smoke coming out of his ears. Okay? Oh. So then the I next could see night, it. And, and, I mean, yeah. it felt like anything but a preseason road trip. So the next Told night, me. Kane's playing Montreal Saturday night and a goaltender playing his first Hurricanes game by the name of Anton Hudobin. Hudobin, yeah. Hudobin stole the show, okay? Yeah. So the Canes win. So I get on the plane, and there's Jimmy, okay, sitting there, and I'm like, okay, coming off win. I can now tell him the hairy story. Keep in mind, the Hurricanes had a defenseman who was a very serviceable defenseman, an extremely likable guy, Jay Harrison, playing. Yeah. Okay? Yep. So I get on the plane, I say, Jimmy, I saw Harry and Buffalo, you're, you're, you're not going to believe this story. And I told him the story about, yeah. you know, concussion being a lower body injury. <laughs> no smile, no nothing. He looks oh, at me. No. no smile, no nothing. He goes, Harry better worry about his own game. Stop <laughs> cracking jokes. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I Oh, paused. that's too good. No, I paused. That, and yeah. I said, Jimmy, do you think we're talking about Jay Harris? You got we're the wrong guy. Him. We're talking yeah. about Harry Neal. Yeah. And he goes, and I got like a closet smile from yeah. him. And I just, I, I kept moving moving onward to broadcast uh, or something. Anyway, oh, that's funny. That is that's, funny. <laughs> that's the only uh, compass thing. That's Hall of Famer Jim Rutherford. He will yeah. love both these stories. One of the best, man. He's one of the best. One of the best. And you know what? Again, of service, right? We bring it back uh, full circle. Service. You know, yeah. played a long time, had a very successful playing career in the league at our position and Started work with CompuWare and you know the rest of it. I don't have to tell you because that's your neck of the woods. But, you know, I first came, I first got to meet him when I was playing junior hockey in the OHL when he was running the Detroit Junior Wings at the time. And him and Mo, Coach Mo, as a young coach. So um, that wasn't lost on me. And then Coach Mo coached me in the top prospect game too, the CHL top prospect game. So that's how far back we went. And it was really cool to have the opportunity for that to uh, to manifest a play for the Canes for that, man. They're top people. Top, top, top people. people. Yeah, they're a boardwalk and park place put together. Um, Absolutely. Okay, in finality, because we've dug in so deep. I mean, we've had our John Deere, Volvo Construction, Case New oh, yeah. Holland, Caterpillar. We've had all the equipment digging in deep today. Big time. Shortly, our dear friend, the greatest, yeah. Johnny oh, is. Yeah. Nice. First round matchup. I think he's yep. on the grandstand shortly. Yep. Let's talk about our man is because I'll tell you, I want to see it. I want to see this cat win the U.S. Open so bad. All right. So what are we looking for from the great is today? Play to his strengths. Play to his strengths, and you know his greatest strength is the serve. The best server in in tennis history, in men's tennis history. So I'm looking forward to see him uh, work the serve. He's in great shape. Uh, I'll I'll let you take it from here because on our voice our our group chat you had a great note on him in terms of your suggestion for his game and what was it Tripper? Well, when he dug in, he said that uh, you know there have been uh, some of the tense moments in matches when we think about tiebreakers, sure. um, where he he has felt he's felt his his body tighten up, sure. And so when uh, thinking about that. I remember, you know, when Cam Ward won the con Smythe, you know, one day I, I went I to him. He had, he had have fun written in marker, you know, where the, the blade meets the, the heel, of the blade meets the shaft of his stick, we see. Right. And I said, Wardle, what's this? And he said, my dad told me at a very young age, the more fun you have, the better you play. Totally. And so he wrote that in marker, every one of his NHL sticks. So on our voice note, I just – you know, if, if his is, is in a tiebreaker, let's hope down the road against Jokovic in the yep. final. You know, yep. I love that. I love the sound just, of that. Just remember, you're going to bounce the ball. No, he's, I'm thinking of Macro. He's a right. He bounces the ball. You're one of those <laughs> Goliath serves. Yep. You know, ha have fun. Because you're never going to get that moment back. And, and then, as you mentioned, 
uh, so eloquently on your voice note to him this morning. Uh, we're a thousand percent behind him. If it was possible to go uh, infinite uh, percent, that's how much we're back in the grade is. Exactly. We're pulling for you is go out there, be yourself, have fun, be in the moment and just shine brightly like you do, man. Let it all hang out. We're here for you. We're behind you. you. We know? got nothing. He's got nothing to lose because he says, guess what? You're going to win yeah. it. I said, but well, we're exactly. going to be here any day that ends in a Y no matter what. A hundred percent. We're here and we can't wait. We can't wait to see you um, as this tournament goes along. And a, a quick note on that trip. I said this on, on our voice memo as well. My good buddy, Mark Rowe, who used to work with us on the NHL network uh, up in Toronto. He works at TSN and he does fantastic work. He covers the U S open every year. He usually comes here to New York for it. Him and I often get together and he'll be covering it from the studio back in Toronto. And so too, Steve Mears, Mearsy, yep. our good Mears. buddy Mearsy, who, who was with us on the NHL network, voice of the Pittsburgh Penguins, one of their voices, he's covering it as well. So is, we know your love for hockey and you know, hockey's love for you and some of our beloved hockey, uh, esteemed colleagues in the broadcast booth will be pulling for you as well. Weeksy, I'm going to make you a deal. We're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to adjourn now because both of us need to, you know, you know, the, these, these bodies, these chiseled frames <laughs> didn't happen by accident. Exactly. We got to do yeah, some work we this go afternoon. Skull. We got to yeah. go skull. You know, listen, yeah. the David and uh, the Rodan's David at the academia in Florence, that wasn't, sculpted after me you know because it just <laughs> happens naturally <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but, so uh, i, I want to make a I, yeah. I would like to make a deal with you uh yeah. obviously we we covered some infinitely bigger than hockey stuff at the beginning oh, yeah uh and then we we got into you know some of the things you know lighthearted moments that you and i enjoy mm -hmm. so so much but yeah. uh thanks for doing this and what we're going to do uh, mm -hmm. you, your favorite restaurant uh, used to be the Strip House in New York, and you still dig it, but it seems yep. like you're finding your way to Ocean Prime all the yep. time. I, I yep. saw you just you just had the uh, the blue cheese encrusted ribeye. Yep. Uh, what's it? What do you go with sometimes? The snapper when you go to the uh, the sea? What do you go with? Sea bass yeah. snapper? Or what? Yeah, their red snapper is amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. It's so good. It's so, so tasty. Okay. So yeah. for digging in, I would like to invite you uh, and the woman you overachieved with, the great Meg, <laughs> to Ocean Prime. And hopefully we'll have a U.S. Open champion with us. The great is. But we'll invite him. And I'd like to take you all out. Uh, if Brendan Moore wants to fly up for it, the only, uh, uh, the only uh, rule that we have is that you sit with us uh, without doing wall sits or push-ups. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Be committed to the meal, Roddy. Okay. We know, we, we already know that you're, that you're, yeah, Rod the bot, but be committed to the meal for one time. There won't be very many green beans at this one. I got to tell you that right now, Tripper, maybe a Caesar, maybe a wedge salad, but there won't be very many green beans or beets at this one. Rixie, I love yeah. you with all my heart. Love I'm you glad too, you buddy. Occupy my thumb. I'm yeah. Sure thank I'm you. Going back to the top of the show. Yes. Um, and, and I am, aside from our friendship, which I'm most grateful for, on behalf of uh, the entire hockey world, mm. we could not be more fortunate um, during these uh, unprecedented times um, to have such a brilliant ambassador with beyond supremely high character that seems to always have the right message and the right approach. Um, and uh, thanks for digging in. And I'm just going to leave it at that because you know I love you. Uh, thanks so much, man. I appreciate you. Love you too, man. Uh, keep up all the amazing work. These have been great. I listen to them uh, most daily. And you're doing, I mean, obviously amazing work on the camera, but on your platform as well too. You, you've really charted a course to be able to connect with so many different people and so many different personalities around our game and give a lot of the fans uh, even more of what they want, which is even more insight and behind the scenes in hockey and, and people in general. So continue the great work on here. Thanks to your producer, Adam, as well. And more importantly, the all you NHL fans around the world that, that tune in here to Digging In With Trip and, uh, and also that tune in to watch them on Fox Sports Carolinas that watch us on the NHL Network. We appreciate you. And I really want to highlight 
for a lot of the, the viewers, players, coaches, GMs, uh, esteemed hockey personnel. The support that we've gotten from the majority of you and a lot of you has been, uh, has been overwhelming. It really has. It's been tough to keep myself composed on the air at different times because I've been moved by a lot of the support and the empathy and the compassion and and uh, and just the human decency and touch and grace around some of these challenges. And, you know, just remember, we're all interconnected. And you know this too, based on uh, what you know with Jacob Slavin, Tripper. And, you know, we all have family members and friends and loved ones that are on different sides of uh, the gender wheel, the color wheel, religious wheel, um, you know, you name it, the geographical wheel. And that's part of what makes us, makes us in general, and I mean that in terms of everybody, so great. And what makes North America as great as it is and what makes the United States the great country that it is. So let's always keep that in mind. And as we continue to chart a course going forward, we stay as unified as possible, whether it's COVID, whether it's racial inequality, any of the aforementioned things, stay as unified as we can. And we're only as strong as, uh, as a sum of our collective parts. So thanks to everybody for tuning in, man, and for digging in with us as well. Weeksy, uh, and you sharing a, a story that is in your heart, beyond close to your heart, a challenge to everybody thinking about that story mm. and what you said we should learn from it. Let's all be of service. I know I will be thinking about that each and every moment. I'm going to try in each and every conversation I have. How can I be of service to the person that I'm with right now um, mm. to make the world I know it sounds deep, cheesy, cliche, but how can I be of service to make the world a better place uh, and do my part and, you know, be a unifier, not a divider. And thank you for that, in the, the entire episode, but in particular, that uh, instruction about service. Oh, my pleasure, man. Love you. Hi to mom. And, uh, you know, we'll talk offline and let's see if our man is works his magic right off, the, right off the hop out of the gate. I'm sure he will. Yeah, let's hope he sets a tone. Let's hope he digs in. Let's hope he has fun. And uh, I'll be talking to you in the next few hours. Uh, my mom, uh, I don't know where she is in the house, but uh, she's on the board of directors of WeLoveKevinWeeks.com. Uh -huh. Thank you. Big <laughs> hug to mom, man. Thank you. Love you too. Love you both. Have a great day, partner. Appreciate you, man. Love you. Kevin, that was... Uh, that was powerful. Um, and in particular, thank you for sharing this episode about your friend, your late friend, and we dedicate um, this digging in episode to him. Uh, and I know I will uh, try to each day, each week, each month, each year, always bear in mind, what can I do to be of service? Like you challenged me and challenged all of us um, to be uh, here today. Um, thank you so much for allowing this episode to happen to our presenting sponsor, New Country Auto Group. Uh, New Country, um, premier auto dealerships, whether it be Ferrari, uh, Porsche, Maserati, uh, Lexus, uh, BMW, Mercedes, uh, New York, uh, many dealerships in Connecticut, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and in Florida. Um, my personal connection to New Country is that uh, I'm proud to call one of the owners. It's a family-owned uh, business, uh, Jared Cantanucci, the Nooch. I affectionately call him a dear, dear friend. He is a uh, brilliant, uh, hardworking, uh, as Kevin Weeks would talk about, always detailed, never takes a day off human being. He never took a shift off when he played at Chaddock St. Mary's. And he's never let me uh, forget the fact that he had 152 points in 50 games one year. Um, but that is, that is relevant because after taking those hockey talents and was a student athlete at Harvard, he has taken that never take a shift attitude off um, to um, making new country auto group thrive. I think really when it comes to an auto group in the United States, there's nothing that even compares. Uh, they should have, Sinead O'Connor, nothing compares to you advertising for them. Newcountry.com. And Zim's Vodka, um, the smoothest vodka on planet Earth, Polish made, uh, patiently prepared uh, before it went to market from the great Terry Olson, uh, founder and owner of Zim's. Um, 
former hockey player like the great Rod Brindamore at uh, Notre Dame and Wilcox, Saskatchewan, a Western Michigan Bronco, a pure Michigan guy. Um, their top level, Zim's 59, um, was good enough for 99, Wayne Gretzky. Um, good enough that he signed the bottle. Um, so that's pretty much the only endorsement you need when it comes to creating the smoothest vodka on planet Earth. Zim's with an I, vodka. Com. Until the next time, uh, thank you for enjoying. Yes, it uh, it was one of our longer episodes, but um, no stone left unturned with the guy who is who resides in my big thumb. Big thumb, wasn't that a line from Stripes? <laughs> wasn't it Stripes? What a film. Sergeant Hulka, <laughs> you're the big thumb. Was it Bill Murray? The great Kaniac, Bill Murray, who delivered that line? Wow, Kevin Weeks. I certainly am beyond proud when I think of my lifelong friends to now know that he occupies my thumb. <laughs> we will talk to you next time here on Digging In. Until then, stay safe and please always think about how can I be of service. We're digging in with Trip today, yeah. Today, yeah. Today, yeah, today.